I think we might get underway. I uh, just want to start before we do anything else. Um, it is a massive honor for me on behalf of every one of the faculty over here to say a huge congratulations to you all for getting into part two law. It is a fantastic achievement, um, one that you should not underestimate. Um, and I hope, before we get into anything else, I hope that you have all taken the time to celebrate, um, and hopefully with people that have helped you to get where you are, um, because it is a massive deal. Um, but as I was told in my part two orientation um, a few years ago, it's really difficult to get into law school. Uh, it's way more difficult to get out of it. Um, so, so I hope you celebrate now while you still feel like you can. Um, so welcome, my name is Kaya Patel. Um, I actually don't work here at all. Um, I've got nothing to do with the law school, so hopefully that means I can say stuff that they can't. Um, I graduated from Auckland Law School three years ago. I did a BCom LLB, um, and I loved my time here, um, both because I had lots of fun, um, but also it set me up for what I'm doing now, which is quite cool. So since I finished, um, I got admitted to the bar, um, became a barrister and solicitor of the High Court, which is probably still the um, most proudest achievement I've, I've done. Um, I went and got my CA, and I'm now working um, at PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, and they have um, allowed me to come and spend the day here with you guys, which is cool. Um, so congratulations. What I'm going to go through firstly is just a quick program to show you what we're going to get up to today. But essentially what we're going to teach you today, or at least tell you today, is just stuff to help you navigate through, especially the first two years of law school, um, because there are a lot of things that are different to um, university, the rest of university, or the outside world as you might call it. Um, so hopefully we can help you navigate through some of these things that you're going to see. Um, and, and before I get into that, just um, a massive thank you as well for choosing us, choosing Auckland Law School. Um, Look, we're really proud of, of our status and the rankings and all that kind of stuff. We work hard for them. But at the end of the day, we realized that if you wanted to, you could have chosen to go to AUT. Um, you didn't. Probably a good thing. Um, but hey, hey, thank you very much for choosing us. There are a lot of good outfits out there. Um, um, so hopefully uh, you'll end at some point at this law school and you'll think that you had a fantastic journey with us. So, um, program today, we're going to start off with a welcome from our acting uh, dean, Professor Warren Swain. Uh, we'll then get into the part two structure. So just a bit of a look at the four law part two courses that you'll be doing um, this year or over the next two years if you're doing conjoint. And then we'll get the course directors for each of those part two courses to give you a bit of an overview of those, those specific courses as well. Uh, especially as a lot of them are things that you might not have come across before. Um, it's a really good idea to keep an open mind at this point. Um, most of you probably decided to do law because of Harvey Specter. Um, <laughs> but once you get into law school, you kind of realize that there's a whole range of diverse things you can do. Um, so keep an open mind at some of these courses because they really do open up avenues. Um, and then after that, we'll get through some, uh, a couple of courses on study techniques and how we run tutorials. Um, we'll do Law 298, um, which is a compulsory course that you're going to take this year. And then we'll start talking about some career opportunities um, and the kind of things you can do now to make sure that when you're ready to graduate, you're coming out of law school with, with options, with offers um, when you walk out the door. So Clodagh will take that. Um, then we'll get one of our students, Gary, to come in and talk to you about the student experience. Um, we'll then talk about how we like to provide um, a safe, inclusive um, environment here at law school and some of the things we are doing, what you can get involved with um, to help us do that. Um, and then we'll give you a bit of a look at some student societies, kind of things on offer. Um, we get that AUSA runs a whole bunch of things. You can join the Meet Club if you want. That's great. Um, but we've got some law-specific student societies as well, uh, which will help you in your endeavors here at law school as well. Um, so we'll do that. And I think we've got a barbecue after that as well. So feel free to come down to law school for that. Um, but um, we'll kick off um, with uh, Professor Warren Swain. Thank you, guys. Tedekoto Kato, uh, welcome. Uh, my name's Professor Warren Swain. I'm the acting dean. Um, when the uh, talk we just had mentioned um, somebody called Harvey Specter, I was rather in the position of a judge of the 1960s who said, who are the Beatles? Um, I understand it's a television show. Um, 
I am Dean in the interim between the departure of Professor Stockley and the arrival of the new Dean, uh, Penny Matthew, next month. A few days ago, I welcomed the Part 1 students. To you, I simply say, welcome back. You'll face new challenges and hopefully find new things to inspire you in Part 2. But first of all, I'd like to re-emphasise and say well done for reaching part two. I know the sacrifices that have been made by you and your families, and you've worked very hard, so congratulations. I'm now going to give you a quote, which is taken from the British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill when describing the Battle of El Alamein in the North African campaign, one of my sidelines is an interest in military history. <coughs> Churchill said this after the British uh, beat, uh, forced the German general, General Montgomery, back. Now, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. The campaign was a turning point. A Rommel was pushed back, and of course, after several years later, the Allies had their victory. I'm not saying that doing a law degree is like fighting a war. Such an analogy would be patently ridiculous. However, it does have some things in common. It's attritional, you may suffer some defeats or setbacks. The key is to keep going. Studying law is like the army in one sense. In another way, it's a collaborative process. In this process, it doesn't, just, it doesn't mean at all following orders, but it means something more positive, transformational even, and that isn't talked about enough. It's about learning, not just from the uh, teaching staff, and I will be taking the first four weeks of contract. It means learning from your friends and your fellow students. This can be the form of study groups or something less formal. But it's really important to talk about the work that you're doing. You also need to think about where you are, and hence the quote. You're now in part two, which is perhaps the end of the beginning. But more than that, it's an opportunity to think carefully about what is the law and what does the law do. These, of course, are big questions, and perhaps ones that didn't bother Harvey Specter, whoever that is. <laughs> The great English poet, W.H. Auden, wrote a poem, Law is Like Love. In the poem, he contrasted the different senses of law, the law of nature, law of religion, etc. He devoted a verse to the law of the sort that you will study. Law, says the judge, as he looks down his nose, speaking clearly and more severely. Law is, I've told you before. Law is, as you know, I suppose. Law is, but let me explain it once more. Law is the law. I know little about love and so cannot comment on whether that comparison is a valid one. But it's worth reflecting on the way that the judge in Auden's poem presents the law as something certain and something definite. This may be how lay people, or for these purposes non-lawyers, think about the law in commonly. The truth, of course, is more complicated than that, as it often is. The law is often contradictory, Judges in different cases, or even the same case, may say different things. They may reach the same result for different reasons. 
Part two, as I see it, is about gaining a deeper understanding of that process, the process of legal reasoning. This isn't just a matter of analysing legal doctrine. It's also about where law sits, or what might be termed, or was termed by some um, trendy academic hippies in the 1970s as a contextual or critical analysis of the law. It's important, though, to note that we are in New Zealand in the early 21st century, and that really matters in terms of the sense of the law and the way that the law is applied. It's not just a law of anywhere, it's a law in a particular context. As far as the teaching is concerned, we'll have introductions from the course directors. As I say, you're um, unfortunate, as you may see it, to uh, have me for the first four weeks of contract, for those of you who are uh, studying contract. It's actually one of the highlights of my year between university committees and other management functions and writing books to lecture the first four weeks of contract. It's a real privilege. And I hope that some of you will gain some enjoyment in law and, of course, in the law of contract, and how could you not? <laughs> but as well as study, it's important to say something final. Remember to take care of yourselves as well. Be kind to yourself. And um, what I mean by that is by taking time off, but also what I mean by that is be uh, understanding that learning law is difficult, that this is normal to find it difficult. It's not anything wrong with you. It's actually just very usual. So be kind to yourself and be uh, in your expectations that you put on yourselves. When I say don't spend all your time working, it perhaps is always amusing to the uh, academic and professional staff here, given that people say that I'm a workaholic, so perhaps it doesn't come particularly easy for me. But don't forget that university is more about work, an academic sense in a, a conventional sense. Uh, one of my great regrets in life is that I spent all my undergraduate time at Oxford and in the decades since working. It's too late for me, but it isn't too late for you. <laughs> I say it slightly flippantly, but actually that's really important. If you take anything out of anything I say, it's that. So please take advantage of the range of opportunities on offer through student societies. And don't forget, too, that university is an important time to forge friendships. When you're dean, you can get by with having no friends and plenty of enemies. But for you... <laughs> It's really important, and it makes the whole experience richer because it's really, as I say, important to engage with your cohort. Don't forget to, and I'll finish on this, to have some enjoyment in work and outside it. I hope there'll be stuff that you study that you find interesting, and not just the law of contract. Uh, <laughs> But don't forget that that, too, is important. I'll now pass on to uh, my colleagues, and I'd wish you all uh, very good luck as you move into part two, and I hope that you all have a very good year. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, before we move on, two points I really want to um, touch on with that. The first is that it is difficult. It is an attrition, a battle of sorts. Um, and some of you will have had battles getting here, um, even into part two. Um, but at the moment, you're on a clean slate. And whatever has happened in the past couple of years, 
um, it doesn't matter. It took me two attempts to get into law school. I didn't make it on the first time. Um, and in my head, that was a massive deal. Um, but you'll quickly find that actually everyone's in the same boat. Um, you will all struggle with things, and you will all succeed very well at other things. Um, but it definitely doesn't impact the outcome at the end. Um, and the second part of that is to, is to make sure you have some fun while you're here. Because um, every single person that leaves university, I guarantee, will tell you um, that they wish they had taken more time to enjoy themselves while they were here. Um, it's not something you're likely to do again at this time in your life, so make sure you uh, enjoy it. Next up, we'll have an uh, introduction into the Part 2 courses. So this is really important. Your, your entire year, or if you're doing conjoint, your next two years, this is some information on how that is going to run. So I'd like to please welcome um, professional teaching fellow Bronwyn Davies. Thank you very much. <coughs> Let me get organised up here. Um, good morning and the warmest of welcomes to you all. Uh, my name is Bronwyn Davies and I wear two hats today. Well, none at all actually, but two hats. First and foremost, I am the Director of uh, Legal Research Writing uh, and Communication Program, so that's Law 298 to you. Uh, but my second hat is, of course, as the Associate Dean Academic, uh, where, bottom line, I'm responsible for making sure that you check all the boxes going through your LLB program. So I guess that means my middle name is probably Miss Compliance as well. So let me add my warmest congratulations to you all, um, as well as Professor Swain. I certainly don't underestimate what it's taken to get you here. Family, friends, not to mention late nights, slaving over a hot uh, computer, I hope. Um, hard work, of course, got you here, and indeed hard work is what's going to carry you through. Uh, hard work plus smart work. So as Warren has said, um, there's going to be plenty of opportunities for you along the way to enjoy yourself whilst at law school. Um, what we are going to be doing eventually, of course, is celebrating your success at law school at graduation. And it's with that end point in mind that I want to now spend the next 15 minutes or so walking you through the program structure uh, and hopefully give you a bit of a taste of what the journey might look like, at least from a, a pragmatic perspective of what you must do. But I think in life it's often good to have a goal in sight. And so with the end goal of graduation, I want you to have that fixed in your mind, what it is you're going to do when you do wear that pale blue uh, hood. I'd like you to start today with me now thinking about one step at a time one step at a time. This is an endurance, not a sprint race. Uh, and if you keep up the pace, if you treat yourself along the way, if you reward yourself as you go, you will enjoy your time here, I promise. Um, what you don't have in your orientation packs is a student handbook, but what you will have by the end of the day is a document that looks something like this. And this should become your Bible. This should become your bedside reading. In fact, it's clearly mine. Um, perhaps more to put me to sleep than to keep me awake. Um, but in that booklet, you will find all of the rules and regs that relate to your succeeding on this journey. And what I'd like to do is ask you to write on your hand, because in your pack there is actually a pen, write on your hand the important number, page 12. Because page 12 is where you will find this diagram. All right, so by the end of the day, you will have this uh, student handbook. And in it you will find lots of information and as I say, page 12 is where we will start today. And we'll just be looking at the typical LLB degree structure to start off with. My apologies to you, I've just realised it's blue, green and red, so those of you who are colour blind will be challenged by this slide. <laughs>
So, with the end point in sight, I want you to think about what it is that you are going to be studying. Not next year, not the year after, but how you're going to progress your studies. And so, the starting point is to focus around these blue tiles. And for you also to think about what do I want to do with my law degree? What am I going to use it for? So some of you are going to be answering that question right now saying, I'm going to practice law. Some of you are going to say, I want to be an academic. Some of you will say, I have not the first idea, which of course was my approach. For that latter category, you'll want to keep your options open. That's probably the best goal for you to have right now, is to plan a course that keeps your options open. For those of you who are very, very specific in your intent, and your goal is to become a practitioner, then your pathway is relatively clear. Certainly, you will have to do all of the blue tiles. But for those of you who are doing law for a variety of other reasons, you may not want to practice, or you may not need to keep your options open. Uh, you have other things, other plans in mind. I have one student, for example, who wants to be a pilot. Then your degree will look something dis not so similar to this. Now, why is that? It's because the law degree is a professional degree as well as an academic degree. As a professional degree, it therefore means that there's some other body outside the university that dictates what must be in it. Who is that body? It's the New Zealand Council of Legal Education, and it says that if you want to be a lawyer, you need to have three stages in your academic, uh, sorry, in your professional training. The first, of course, being uh, pre-law, the next being the degree proper, and finally continuing legal education after admission, the professional stage of training. So the Council of Legal Education has dictated to us, the University of Auckland, that you must include in your degree seven subjects. And we as a law school have said, and we think, this department believes you must include in your law degree six subjects. So you do the math, that makes a total of 13 compulsory subjects and they appear in blue. Now the good news is you've already done three of those. So that's the pre-law phase. So you've already got a head start. But now we're going to focus around this year and what it takes to carry on in your law degree. And remember, keep the end point in sight. What is it I want to use my degree for is absolutely significant uh, and central to the decisions you're going to make relative to how you will structure your degree. So. You must study 13 subjects, the ones in blue, if you want to practice as a lawyer or if you want to keep your options open. But if you don't want to practice law, then there's a tiny subject here with an asterisk. Although an elective course, the Council of Legal Education requires study uh, students intending to be admitted to the bar to take this course. So we have had that imposed on us by the Law uh, Council of Legal Education, and we as a faculty have decided you must also take jurisprudence. All right, so the structure of your course for part two. I want you to think very carefully around how you need to progress your studies this year. What order am I going to study? And just like part one, you have choices, you have some options. <coughs> There are, however, a couple of absolute mandatory musts. And so we start with Law 298. 298 is your starting point for part two of your degree, and it must be teamed up with at least one of these other three subjects. It doesn't have to, however, be criminal law. It doesn't even have to be public law, torts, or contract. It can be any one of those or all four of them, if you choose. Like me, I did the entire diet of part two subjects in my first year. And my grades show it. <laughs> there is another mandatory element to all of this. You can't pass go until you've collected all five of those subjects. In other words, we will not let you progress on to part three blue tiles until you have all of the part two blue tiles firmly in your back pocket. 
So it's very important for you to collect each subject, get a check in the box, move forward before you aspire to taking land law, equity, jurisprudence or ethics. I will not permit it. What did I say? My middle name is compliance. However, I will let you take an elective, provided that elective has no prerequisites of any of these part two subjects here. So I repeat, in order to take any of the blue subjects in line three, you must have all five of the blue subjects in line two. But if you are one of the 10% who last year dropped exams in and failed one of these courses, I will not permit you to carry on into these subjects, but I might permit you to move into an elective. Now there are rules around that as well, and I won't bore you with them, but provided those subjects that you choose as an elective don't require, say, the law of contract as a prerequisite pass, you can continue with your legal studies. So it seems pretty simple. Um, the example of that would be a student I'm dealing with right now. Uh, he failed his contract law exam. He wants to continue into some part three, part four subjects. I won't permit him to take tax or international law because both of those require law of contract. He can, however, take a lot of other different courses, including an independent research paper where he might want to explore some of those topics that he has uh, indicated interests in but can't enrol in. So what I'm saying to you is there is flexibility. Even though it seems quite rigid, uh, there is some flexibility built in. And speaking of flexibility, you'll have possibly noticed, although you'd need to have bionic eyesight to be able to see, um, that some of these courses uh, have 10 points, some of them have 15, and some of them have 30, some even have 20. So basically the rule here is that law courses come in five different sizes from extra small to small to medium, large and even extra large. And unlike the rest of the university, we do this on purpose to confuse you. No, we do this <laughs> on purpose because not all law is equal. So some subjects have a much greater complexity or a much wider focus or a much deeper understanding and therefore require a greater credit point allocation. It also keeps our staff, uh, our student advisory centre very busy um, and keeping them in work is always a good thing um, because they party a lot. Um, in advising you on how to put together these bricks to ensure that you come out with the absolute end game total of credit points that you need to succeed. Now I've shown you the simple version, but of course 80% of you um, aren't doing just a law degree, you are actually doing a conjoint. In the handbook that you will be getting, we actually also have uh, a sample or a structure around the conjoint program as well. Now, bearing in mind the starting point is the collecting of five part two subjects and bearing in mind that Law 298 is the first one of those subjects and must be paired with one other, you actually have complete freedom about how you sequence your law studies. If you want to just dip your toe, take Law 298 and one other subject. If you want to maximise your grades, perhaps, take 298 and one other subject and then sequence your degree in such a way as it suits you. And part of the success of being at university is to have diversity in all elements of your life, both in terms of your academic studies, your uh, engagement with your colleagues, uh, and this is a way in which you can be particularly creative in structuring your degree. But with creativity, there also come some casualties, and that's why we need you to use your student advice centre. They will be able to help you structure the optimal course for you, so that your interest is sustained, so that your graduation goal is achieved. Always have your endpoint in sight. Um, I want you to also understand that <coughs> 
Sequencing your degree might involve some setbacks. That means you may stumble on some courses, you may need to repeat courses. If they are core compulsory courses, you will have to have them in order to progress. This is something that a large proportion of students will face at some point in their degree. Remember, you are the best students in the university. So therefore, this doesn't make you anything other than somebody who has stumbled. And we are there to help. And it is never going to be, ultimately, a problem, provided you seek help. So please come to us. We will be able to help you use the rules to your advantage. Uh, and we will be able to progress you through your degree. Um, what I want also to highlight are two other key and important elements to your degree, one of which is your opportunities to exchange. This university encourages you, as I say, to expand your horizons and enjoy your time at university. So that means it often gives you the opportunity to leave it and go to another one and compare and see how, how they do things over there. So might I suggest that you think in either your part three or part four of your studies, taking the opportunity to exchange either through one of the arrangements that the law school has or one of the arrangements that the university has for either a semester or for a full year. Uh, I would really encourage you to look at those opportunities and see where they might lie for you. I will have a, uh, I guess, a, a positive disposition towards somebody who has exchanged in terms of crediting you with the studies that you have taken overseas. As I say, there are around 100 possibilities, so there will be an opportunity for you. Um, I'd like to finish up also by talking about another end goal that many of you come into the program with, and that's the LLB Honours. The LLB Honours program is different from the rest of the university in that it's shorter, uh, it isn't necessarily a full year's commitment, and it's 60 points. It can be tacked on to the end of your degree. It can be coordinated within parts three or four. But the most important thing that you need to think of at this stage is that once you've completed your part two subjects, your grades will then be assessed and we will then ascertain whether or not you've met the B plus threshold to be invited to take honours. The honours program is therefore uh, an element that's grafted onto and added to the LLB degree for which you must have a B plus average. And importantly, you must then maintain that B plus average throughout the rest of your degree. Okay, so have that end goal in mind as well. After your part two results are in, we'll then make that assessment and we will automatically um, bring you into the program or invite you into the program. Um, elective courses is uh, the p last part of my presentation today. Um, I want to encourage you to think widely. We offer around 50 elective programs every year, but not all of them are offered each year. So think carefully. Sometimes we offer them on a rotation, maybe a two-yearly two basis. Uh, but sometimes we also offer them as a summer school option, usually four or five courses over summer. So maximize your opportunities, mix and match your courses, take uh, study for interest, not because you think the employers will be impressed by it. Those subjects that you're interested in, of course, are those of the subjects that won't be such hard work. They'll be the ones that you do so very well in. Uh, and also think about the prospect of doing papers that allow you to do independent research. So, papers in lieu of exams. If you are not a good exam taker, maybe you prefer independent research, find courses that allow you to do a paper in lieu of the exam. That means writing a four or five thousand word research essay exempts you from taking the final exam. A good strategy for many of you uh, and also a good way of getting off early to go on holiday at the end of the year before the rest of the crowds. In terms of assessment, my final words will be around assessment. 
Uh, and that is, again, referring to the student handbook, be, please take care to look at page 30. And that is the handing in of assessments, the seeking of extensions, and the awarding, I'm afraid, of penalties. Be very clear. There will be occasions through this year where you are not able to meet the deadlines on your assessment. It happens to us all for a wide variety of very valid reasons. There is no shame in that, but there is harm if you don't seek help. So please, again, student advisors, these are the only people who can support you through this process of seeking an extension. If you don't seek an extension, what are the consequences? Penalties attach, and these will be awarded for either not meeting the deadline or exceeding the word limit. Again, always ask for help if you are struggling with an assessment. Do not, however, ask your instructors, tutors, professors or course directors for an extension. That's simply not fair. Their role is to support you in learning. Our role is to support you in the logistics. So please use your course directors uh, for the best of purposes, that is to help you understand the subject and allow us in the student advice team and in my office to support you in the mire that is the regulations and rules that run this uh, degree program. All right, so on that note, uh, it's my pleasure to hand over to the next part. Um, but my final words, I guess, would be to say to you, make friends, make progress, and make this the very best start to the rest of your life. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I've, always, I've always found it quite interesting that the only difference between um, being able to get your practicing certificate or get to the next stage and not is um, choosing not to take ethics. Um, and I've always been quite dubious of a person that will decide to close off their entire chance of ever getting a practicing certificate just because they don't want to study ethics. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, we're going to carry on with part two courses. Now these will give you a base, um, which is a fantastic grounding, but also help you in one really good area of your personal life. Um, I'm not sure if this has happened to you yet. I guarantee it will happen to you by the end of your first year. Um, people will learn that you're studying law and you'll get a call and they'll say, hey, I need to do a will, how do I do this? And you have no idea. Um, in my case, it was a friend from high school that called me up and said, hey, I'm at the police station. Um, I fell asleep behind the wheel, what do I do? Um, your part two courses will give you enough information to be able to say, um, I understand this is a legal problem, now hang up the phone and call a real lawyer. <laughs> so. Um, we've got half an hour, I'll get them to go straight after the other and we'll start with Professor, Professor Julia Tommy for Criminal Law. Kia ora koutou katoa, talofa lava. Welcome to the law school proper. It's really nice to sit here and look around at all your beautiful and interesting faces. I'm here to make a case for the relevance of criminal law and to tell you a little bit more about the subject. So basically we know that about one-fifth of you will end, who end up in legal practice will practice criminal law. So that's not all of you. However, whatever area of law you go into, increasingly the criminal law is used as an enforcement mechanism to back up that regulatory regime. So even if you go into financial law, tax, company law, things that couldn't be further away from criminal law, you will have criminal law come up um, in your practice. Now, I'm actually going to ask you to be a little bit brave um, and give me some information about you. I want you, um, if you've got the courage, to put up your hand if you've ever committed a criminal offence. Thank you very much. Now, basically, what that means is I have a room full of really weird people. Because according to that survey, only a small minority have actually committed criminal offences. So that means the majority of you have never smoked marijuana, have never taken ecstasy or some illegal drug to go to a dance party, have never committed theft, that is, you've never taken something without someone's permission, knowing you plan to use it and might damage it, even if you hope you don't and intend to return it. 
means you've never assaulted someone, that means contacted their body on purpose without their consent or threatened to do so. You have never used indecent or offensive words in a public place, in other words, sworn in public knowing someone could hear you. You have never purposefully damaged someone's property. You have never attempted to bring into hatred or contempt or excite disaffection against Her Majesty or the Government of New Zealand or the Administration of Justice. <laughs> You've never urinated in a public place, other than a public toilet, knowing that someone could possibly observe you. And you've never tried but failed to do any of these things. That's an attempt. Furthermore, you've never even had a friend that you've encouraged uh, to do one of those things, which has been a party to somebody else's offence. So I'll just ask you again, how many people have committed a criminal offence in this room? <laughs> basically a more honest response. <laughs> now that exercise is interesting because it tells us something that criminologists started discovering about the 70s, which is that criminal offending is normal in the population. Um, and there's a huge mass of what we call the dark figure of crime, which is criminal offending that takes place which is never prosecuted and taken through the criminal justice system. So basically, we are the lucky ones. We have had lives that have insulated us from being charged or convicted or ever having the label criminal attached to us, despite the fact that we've breached the criminal law often multiple times. Now, I just want to pause a bit um, and read from a letter from one of our alumni. This is one of your predecessors. So I used to edit our alumni magazine and every time an edition came out, I'd get letters from people either complimenting or criticising uh, the magazine, and this was one of my favourites. It's a very complimentary letter. Dear Julia, I write to compliment you on the 2012, uh, 2012 edition of Eden Crescent. Given the sparsity of my current discombobulation, I found the annual a ripping read. And then he goes on to compliment me about different, um, different articles in that magazine. Thank you, Julia, and editorial support team. Much appreciated. Unfortunately for me, I am currently in custody at Mount Eden, awaiting trial on a raft of charges involving alleged financial mispractices. And then he goes on to share his uh, legal woes and to ask for back copies of, the, of Eden Crescent. Now, my point, of course, here is that the study of criminal law is relevant to all of us and may become even more immediately and personally relevant to some of you in this room at some point in the future. So I know that my colleague's going to do plugs for their subject. That's my plug for the real life relevance of criminal law. Now I'm here as course director of criminal law. It's gonna be taught in three streams this year. We have a fantastic team of teachers. Um, so the first semester, the course is gonna be taught by myself and Dr. Fleur Te Aho. She is from Ngati Matunga ki Taranaki. Her background is in indigenous rights and international law, and she has a particular interest in Māori, Māori approaches to justice and alternatives to incarceration. Um, she was involved with Dr. Kate Doolan uh, just recently in organising our incredibly successful drug and alcohol courts conference. So in the second semester, we'll be taken over by Dr. Kate Doolan. Um, who we, has just recently come to us from the University of Birmingham and has an interest in restorative justice. And Associate Professor Carrie Leonetti, who just joined us from the University of Oregon, um, and she has an interest in comparative criminal procedure and miscarriages of justice and has been involved in the Innocence Project um, in the States. She also has research interests in high-tech surveillance and data privacy. Um, so a very, very interesting suite of uh, <coughs> interests and backgrounds. In this course, we will teach you basic criminal law principles. So how to analyze the components of a criminal offense. We'll cover a selection of the more serious criminal offenses um, and some of our general defenses and different pathways to criminal liability. So you'll have to attend three lectures a week plus do the tutorial program. Our assessment regime consists of four things, all of which are compulsory. So we have a court observation exercise. Um, that's marked on a pass-fail basis, but you have to do it to pass the course. 
Then we have a first semester test, which is worth 20% of your final grade, a tutorial essay, which is worth 10%, that takes place in the second semester, and our final examination, which is worth 10%. So thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you next week. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko Janet McLean tēnē, and I'm the course director of Public Law. And I'm going to ask you the question that I was asked when I was sitting where you're sitting too many years ago to disclose. Look to the right of you and look to the left of you. Now when I was asked that question, I was a, a, the lecturer said, and only one of you will still be standing, <laughs> right, at the end of your law degree. But actually they asked the wrong question. What they should have asked me was, look to the right of you and look to the left of you. One of those people will be the Minister of Justice and the other will be a judge of the Court of Appeal. Because in fact, among my cl classmates, one of my classmates was Andrew Little, who's now the Minister of Justice, and one of my classmates was Joe Williams, who's now a judge of the Court of Appeal. Politics, law. Both very good public lawyers. I won't disclose the rest of their exam results. Um, <laughs> now, Professor Tolmy's been talking to you about crime. But what gives the courts the power to even punish crime? Can criminal penalties be passed, passed by Parliament be challenged in the courts? Can a police prosecution for a public disordered offence be challenged on the basis that the accused was exercising her right of free speech, her right to protest? What about if the accused has followed the police officer home and sung songs outside her house? while she was asleep. Is that protected by freedom of speech? These are real cases. These are cases that we discuss in public law. Or what if you've been charged with committing an offence against the fishing regulations and you claim that tikanga or Māori customary law has authorised the taking of that shellfish? Is there a defence in that sort of case? Or what, heaven forbid, we were to quickly, you, you come along to law school for a week and we expel you. Right? And we don't tell you that we're expelling you, we don't tell you the grounds on which we're expelling you, and we don't give you a hearing about whether we're expelled. Right? This is public law. Um, or worse, what if we, and this is a real case that we'll discuss in class, what if we give you a hearing about whether we should expel you but we don't actually disclose to you this report that we've had that is really damning of your character and of what you've been doing. This is public law. Very useful, I find. Um, a lot of students not very engaged in public law, but then are really good at it when they're challenging uh, their assessment or whether they should get, <laughs> right? I should have, you know, I did that, I complied, right? So, so it's really useful in your law degree uh, to do well in public law. So public law is about the background institutions against which law operates. Um, and to be quite honest, the institutional bit is the boring bit, and that's the bit that I have the privilege of teaching you at the beginning of the year, but it all gets a lot better uh, when all my um, colleagues come in. Um, we also uh, are about teaching you about the norms, values, and principles which operate to give our constitutional our constitution life. Principles of natural justice, rights, um, tikanga, and so on. So our mission, if we choose to accept it, is to uh, persuade you that there is a constitution in New Zealand and the public law team will bring it to life to you, for you. And I start off the year, the first seven weeks of the course, and then we'll have um, Associate Professor Anaru Erawiti, who will t talk to you about the executive. He's currently involved in the government inquiry into state care. Uh, so he'll be coming from that 
really big government commitment to teach you. Um, then doctors Jane Norton and Jesse Wall, will, who are of a much more philosophical bent, I think, will be leading you through rights, bills of rights, freedom from discrimination. And then we end the year with Dr Edward Willis, who will be teaching administrative law and the sources of Māori law. So expect politics. Look to your left and look to your right. One's a politician and one's a lawyer, right? Expect politics and disagreement in this course. But it's not going to be enough to just get the constitutional vibe. I want you to get the constitutional vibe. Uh, but we're also going to have to, I'm afraid, uh, read statutes very closely indeed and weave into the readings of statutes some of these broader constitutional principles. There'll be three themes this year. One is the powerful position of executive government, that is, the government of the day, uh, and at the present time, Jacinta Ardern's uh, coalition government. Uh, the relationship between politics and law is a theme throughout the course. And we're also going to be looking at different sources of constitutional authority not just parliament, but international law and tikanga Māori. So those are the things that we're considering in public law, and I hope you enjoy the ride, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Right, the first thing is to get my portrait up there. That's good. Uh, <laughs> I think they did a very good job. Uh, hello everyone, welcome uh, to part two. Uh, my name is uh, Marcus Roberts, uh, as you can see up there. I'm the course director in 2019 for the Law of Torts. Uh, I'm going to tell you uh, two things today. Uh, first, I'm going to try and answer what a tort is um, and why you should study it. And then to finish off, I'll go through uh, three um, administrative points um, that you will get more details on next week. Um, so firstly, let's start off with an easy one. Let's ease you in to the, um, to the course. Why study torts? It's a very easy question because you have to. Because <laughs> Bronwyn said that you can't go into part three without it. Right, okay, let's move on. No, uh, why is it compulsory? Well, it's compulsory because torts uh, covers a wide variety of legal actions in the private law sphere. So we've heard about uh, criminal law from uh, Professor Julia Tommy. We've heard about public law from Pro Professor Janet McLean. Those are both public law areas, something to do with the state. Can't remember, it was a long time ago. Private law is about the law between individuals, two individuals suing each other in court. And in torts, we're looking at actions, private law actions, individuals suing each other uh, for wrongs, or if you look at the basis of the word torts, for crooked or twisted actions, hence the word torsion. Torts, it's the same legal root. So these are actions or events or things that people have done to you or to the plaintiff that are crooked or twisted or, or wrong. We're not looking at crimes. Now, the action complained of may very well be a crime as well, but we are coming at it from a very different point of view. If someone punches you when you're out at night uh, in Queen Street on Saturday night, that is the crime of assault. And the state, via the police, might have an interest in taking you to court and punishing you. But you, the victim, uh, that might not be uh, what uh, necessarily you want, or all of what you want. And so there is also tort, the tort of battery, where you can sue individually the person who punched you, not to punish them, but to get money to get compensation from them to put you in the position you were in before you were punched insofar as money can do that. 
So that's what torts are all about. Private wrongs committed by one person that the plaintiff is suing for. And it covers a huge variety of different things. So we start off and we look at battery, what I just talked about, the punch to the head. Assault, if you come a step closer, I will pull this uh, knife on you, run it through your guts. Um, that is actually a case. Um, assault, of course, confusingly, does not mean the same thing in, in torts as crimes, but we'll, we'll find out about that uh, throughout the year. Uh, and then you look at uh, false imprisonment. If you go and do an uh, to uh, if you go and do an escape room, does that uh, constitute a false imprisonment when you're locked in for an hour and you can't solve the ridiculously hard puzzles that they have? Um, not speaking from personal experience, but uh, <laughs> what about defamation? Someone has wrongfully defamed you, lowered your standing um, in the eyes of a right-thinking person. What about if you've trespassed on someone's land? Well, that's also a tort. What happens if you have failed to secure the hill that's down the bottom of your property and there's a lot of rain and it slides and takes out your neighbor's house? That's also a tort. And that's... The, oh, sorry, and what happens if you then take someone's car for a joyride? Well, that's also a tort. And those are the sorts of things that we'll be looking at in the first semester. In the second semester, we will then go on to the brilliant sunlit uplands that, are, uh, that is negligence. And negligence is such a large and expanding field that in 50 years' time, there won't be four course directors for part two standing here telling... Uh, people what's going to happen in part two. There'll only be one, and that will be the course director of negligence. <laughs> Every, negligence is vastly expanding, uh, and it is very, very important. What happens when you are careless and cause harm to someone else? You don't intend to cause that harm. You don't intend to, um, to burn down their property when you're playing with matches, but it just happens. You were negligent. We will look at that all throughout semester two. That is also a tort. We're not about breach of promise. That's another private law that you might uh, learn about in uh, the law of contract. Assume you do. <laughs> um, but we are looking at private wrongs between individuals' uh, torts. OK, so the administrative stuff. There are four lecturers this year, uh, myself, uh, Nikki Chamberlain, Professor Joe Manning, and Associate Professor Tim Kuna, you will learn more about them as they uh, are throughout the year. They're all approachable, lovely people, and we all have very different expertise uh, and backgrounds, so hopefully we will bring something different and valuable uh, each to the course. Uh, the, first uh, the second administrative point I want to make is that get online, get onto Canvas. That is your first stop for information about the course. If you haven't done so for torts and you're in torts this year, go have a look. The casebook is there. The casebook will also shortly be available for sale in hard copy uh, if you would like to, but you don't have to buy it in hard copy. If you want to look at the cases online, it's available online now, more than happy to do so. But whatever media the casebook comes through, either hard copy or soft copy, you must read the casebook. Torts is very case heavy, it is not statute heavy, you need to read them. We don't quite go back to the 14th century like you do in contract, uh, but we do have cases that are uh, a little bit old. Not 14th century, but a bit old. Canvas is very important. Secondly, very importantly, and I understand differently from the other part two courses, your tutorials that you sign up for in semester one are the tutorials that you are signing up for for the entire year. You stay in the same time, the same tutorial group, with the same tutor in torts for semester one and semester two. Please, 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 please be aware of that when you sign up for tutorials. It carries through throughout the year. The reason we do that is because there's a mooting program that takes place within that same tutorial group throughout the year. So be aware of that when you're thinking about signing up. Just be aware that you'll have to fit your other part two, uh, your other second semester courses around that. Finally. Um, no, that was it. Canvas, Casebook, Tutorials. Excellent. Okay, you'll hear more about those administrative things on Monday. I will be there uh, to introduce you to the course more fully. 
Thank you uh, for listening. Please enjoy Torts, enjoy the rest of your part two, have a good time, go well, and congratulations. Thank you. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, I'm Karen Fairweather, as you can see from the slide, and I am the course director for contract law. Um, I'd like to begin by giving you a very, very warm welcome um, to add to the welcome you've already had, and many congratulations on getting this far. Um, contract law may be last on the agenda today, uh, but it's certainly a case of last but not least in terms of the relevance and importance of this subject. I'd like to begin with a piece of good news, um, and that is that while a min minority of you will so far have had direct experience of criminal law or the law of tort, I can safely assure you all that everyone in this room today is already, at a practical level, an expert in contract law. Um, you all have um, engaged in a myriad of day-to-day -day activities um, that are based on the law of contract. You may not realize it as yet, but you have. So, for example, every time you get on a bus or a train, you buy a cup of coffee in the morning, you order a meal in a restaurant, you do your supermarket shop, you have entered into a contract. And um, every time you access the internet at home, if you think about it, you're actually doing that on a contractual basis. Contract also underlies those big, happy moments of our lives that we remember. So things like buying your first house, getting your first job, that's all based on the law of contract. And crucially, uh, the law of contract really is the backbone um, and the facilitator of the business and commercial world. So for those of you who may have your heart set on earning the really big bucks as commercial lawyers, and I can see dollar signs shining from a few eyes out there, um, take heed. Contract law is very, very important indeed. It's important in its own right as a subject, and um, I hope you'll see that um, this year, but it's also important because the general basic uh, principles of the law of contract you're going to get this year underlie so many other areas of law that you may be interested in, in practicing in the future. So take, for example, employment law or banking law or the law of insurance. Those are specialist areas of law. Um, they have their own special rules, whether those rules have been created by the legislature or by the courts. But those special rules sit on top of this foundation of these general basic principles of contract law, which we're going to study this year. So when I say contract law is absolutely foundational, I mean it in quite a literal sense. And um, we'll do our very, very best by the end of this year to ensure that you have a theoretical and academic knowledge of contracting that matches the practical experience you've actually already got of this subject. To put it another way, we hope that by the end of this year, when you tag on on the bus in the morning um, or you buy your morning cup of coffee, you've become thoroughly self-conscious about it all. And I mean that in a positive way, of course. So, um, in a nutshell, what is the law of contract all about? I think at the heart of it is this idea of a contract as a consensual agreement between the parties, whereby the parties voluntarily undertake obligations. Uh, that's the core idea, agreements or promise. But what we see is that actually it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because sometimes, um, not often, but sometimes the law actually imposes contractual obligations on the parties. And sometimes you have what to a layperson may look like a consensual agreement, but for some technical reason, the law says we will not enforce that as a legal contract. 
So that's the heart of contract law. Um, I think it's best thought about as a story with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's certainly the structure that we follow in this course. Um, so three parts. And as quite conveniently, there are three of us um, teaching into this course, um, we will broadly cover, with a couple of um, overlaps or things that don't fit quite neatly, we broadly cover one part each. Now, you've already met Warren this morning, and uh, Warren will be kicking off with the first part of the story, the beginning of the story. And um, in line with Warren's sunny, optimistic temperament, um, Warren is going to deal with this happy beginning of the story, where the parties are establishing their contractual relationship. Everything's optimistic. It's all going to go well. Um, so Warren will be looking in the four, first four weeks with you at contract formation and the requirements that the law says have to be there for an agreement to have the status of a contract. Then it's over to me and I'll spend the first two weeks finishing off that. But I'm afraid when we get into the middle of the story, um, we get beset by paranoia, neurosis, and soul searching. Perhaps that says something about me as well, but um, this is where we start asking questions like, well, we've got a contract, but what are the terms of the contract? Um, are those the complete terms of the contract? Have we missed something? Is there something that the court needs to imply into this contract that we haven't said? What on earth is it that we've, we meant when we used the words that we did in our contract? So that's the middle of the story, and I'll be dealing uh, with that aspect. And then finally, we move into a stage of really doom and gloom, because the end of the story, this obviously doesn't happen in real life. Normally, contracts all end happily. Everyone does what they're supposed to do. But we're academics, so we don't think like that. And in stage three, um, you're going to look at what happens when it all goes wrong. What happens when one party refuses to perform or performs their side of the deal defectively? What remedies does the other party have in that sort of situation? What happens if one party turns to the other and said, well, OK, we had a contract, but actually I entered into that contract under a mistake or I entered into the contract because you misled me. That's the doom and gloom stage, and that will be dealt with by Professor Dawson in semester two. So I hope that gives you just some flavor of um, the structure of the course. Finally, just a couple of practical matters. Um, I know that Warren emailed you all last week and told you all about the case book and readings, etc. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention assessment. All this is set out in Canvas, so please have a, a careful look at this. But there are three items of assessment. You'll have a test in late May, which I think is 20%, a tutorial essay due at the beginning of semester two, which is worth 10%, and that final exam um, at the end of semester two. I'd like to finish with just a word of advice to you. Um, and this is about tutorials. Tutorials are not actually compulsory in this course. Nonetheless, um, there's really no substitute for that practice of taking problem questions, identifying issues, and applying the law to those facts. Um, you may feel that you have a good grasp of the principles we teach you in the lectures in abstract. But it's not until you really come to apply those principles to factual situations that you really start to test your knowledge and understanding. So I think really key to success in this course is um, really engaging in the tutorials, really participate fully and prepare thoroughly. Um, your tutorials really are your friend in this course, so please make the best of them. Um, that's it from me. Um, I really look forward to getting to know you all a bit better when I take over from Warren in week five. And in the meantime, um, I wish you a great start to the semester. All right, everyone stand up. 
All right, so we've, we've, we've heard that it's hard to get into law school, harder to get out. This is, my, in my opinion, a really good test to see your intelligence, whether you're going to survive or whether you might not. Um, so it's a bit of a physical exercise. I want you to put your hand out in front of you and then turn your palms away so they're facing away and then put one palm over the other, clasp your hands together so that your thumbs are at the bottom. Cool. All good? So make sure your thumbs are at the bottom. All right. If you're going to make it through law school, you better do this. On the count of three, I want you to just twist your hands back. Go. <laughs> cool. Grab a seat. Next up, we have a seminar on study techniques and tutorials from senior lecturer Rob Batty. So please uh, give him a welcome. Thank you. Hello everyone, really, really, really good to see some familiar faces. Um, some of you probably thought that was the last you'd ever see of me, but no, I'm back. Um, and yes, I've even put on a suit today and a tie, um, much to my family's amusement when I walked out the door. Um, but today I'm actually wearing my Associate Dean Teaching and Learning hat. Um, and I've been asked to talk to you about study techniques and tutorials. So in preparation for this little talk, I emailed and chatted to all of our wonderful course directors that we've just met. And I asked them to think about what would you advise your incoming classes to do? What kind of behaviours, what kind of techniques would you suggest would help them maximise their chances of success? And luckily they said a whole lot of common things. Now some of these are kind of obvious, but hopefully within this list you might pick up something of use. The first one is to attend your lectures, which is kind of an obvious thing for um, course directors and lecturers to say. But everyone thought it was really important that you turn up to lectures because listening to the recordings is just not the same. <coughs> The actual experience of turning up to a lecture is really beneficial. The second thing is to actively listen. And the key word there is actively listen and take notes. Now I'm going to say something controversial about that a little bit later. But sometimes I understand there's a bit of a black market of previous year's notes. <laughs> That sounds wonderful, but I don't think it really helps you. It's the actual process of taking notes that's really important. The third thing they said is to ask questions. Now, some of you may be shy, like me, and I didn't ask a question or talk to a lecture the whole time I was at law school. Um, but even though I didn't do that, actively paying attention to the questions that are asked are really important. You can also, as you're learning, note your own questions. Talk to them with your peers, and perhaps even use your lecturer's office hours to go through those questions. But again, noticing the questions and noticing the answers is really important. Related to that, the course directors suggested you think about utilising they're office hours. Now, even for Law 141, for some of my office hours, I was sitting there by myself. I had allocated that time. I had put those two hours or three hours aside. And it's often the case that people don't utilize those office hours. But think about doing that. It's a good way to clarify concepts, to ask the questions you're perhaps too shy to ask during class. The fifth one is about preparation. Nearly everyone said that preparation is important. As Marcus talked about, for a, case, for a subject like torts, there's going to be a lot of cases. Same too for contract. Now, I remember when I was at law school that I was mostly um, one of my strongest memories is highlighters, sort of dimly 
lit rooms and case books. It really does help. Sometimes just reading the cases over and over again, well not necessarily over and over again, just reading one case and then another case, it really builds your ability to think about legal argument and think about the area of law. So they said preparation. Number six was a suggestion by Janet, which is really important for a subject like public law. Don't expect things to be settled and for there to necessarily be a clear answer all the time. And she talked about thinking about cases and issues from both sides of the coin. Think about counter arguments, think about the main arguments being put forward. The seventh suggestion I had was to be smart in terms of your exam preparation and to use previous exams, which are all available, to practice. One of the things I found and um, I talked about last year is that there is such thing as an exam technique and some people have wonderful exam techniques and they do very well because of it. The good thing is we can all improve through practice. And the last thing picks up on something that Karen said. Treat tutorials seriously. Now, because I was going to talk to you as Associate Dean Teaching and Learning, I thought I'd better put in some research. Um, so I pulled out this um, collection of data. And what I want you to look at is perhaps those bottom four, particularly the bottom three. So the evidence seems to be pretty strong that one of the best ways to learn is to teach someone else. And tutorials give you that opportunity. They give you an opportunity to learn together, to talk things over with your peers. And that's really important for a subject like law. So I would really strongly encourage you to make the most of your tutorials. And sometimes it'll be hard to have the time to do the preparation, but again, that preparation is going to be important for tutorials. The more you put in, the more you'll take out. As Karen alluded to as well, often the tutorials are another way to practice, but practice in a safe environment. Often the tutorials are framed around previous exam questions or test questions. So coming along to tutorial, having the opportunity to talk through that problem with somebody else, really it's invaluable and I strongly encourage you to do it. So for all of those double semester courses you have to look forward to, criminal, public, torts and contract, there's eight tutorial rounds, four in each semester. Now the last thing I, well one of the things I said at the beginning was I was going to say something provocative. And this is what I'm going to say. Um, I was listening to a blog the other day, you know, as you do, listening to a law blog um, by a law professor. Um, and they started talking about the evidence around laptops. Now even when I teach you guys, well, I taught you guys in part one, there's often an ocean of laptops looking back at me. There's now pretty strong evidence that there's something about handwriting. There's something about making notes that's different from laptop note taking. Now, I've got a reference there to a study. It's very scientific, it has graphs, um, has formulas. <laughs> I read the abstract, took the abstract away. Um, but the main point is if you are typing on a laptop, you tend to just copy down everything the lecturer says. But if you're taking notes, there's more of an opportunity to synthesize what's being said, reflect on what's being said, 
and in doing so, kind of encode that in your memory. Now, this is just me being provocative. Um, uh, this is no compulsion whatsoever, just something to think about. A number of US professors at, at law schools have banned laptops in their classrooms. I wouldn't ever go that far, but um, just something to think about in terms of your learning and study techniques. So that's all I wanted to say today, but I also wanted to reiterate um, how wonderful it is to see some familiar faces and to say to you, um, as has been said before, um, sincere and heartfelt congratulations for making it into part two. Um, I hope you do very well and enjoy um, the journey in part two. And if you see me around, please do not hesitate to say hello. Good luck. All right, guys, um, we're going to have a bit of a break, um, 15 yeah. minutes. Um, if you can all come back at 10.45 on the dot, that'd be great, and we'll get started with the next part of the vision. Yeah. All right, kia ora, everyone. We will make a start. Welcome back. We're in our second half. We're getting there. Um, our first session is on uh, Law 298. Now, um, as Julia and Bron would, would have said earlier on in the day, one of the compulsory courses that you have to do is 298. I want to say this. It may not be about a specific area of the law, like some of these other courses that you've had introductions to, but from experience, as somebody now working in the law, this is the most, like, I'm not even kidding, like the most important course you'll ever do. Um, if you go out and practice law, this is the kind of stuff you'll need to know in order to do your job day in, day out. So um, it's a very useful one to wake up for if you're not already. So um, <laughs> can I please introduce Nicola Ronsley and Xiao Wei Ding. Thank you. Oh, hello everyone. I hope you're enjoying your uh, morning so far today. Um, so that was a great introduction, good promotion for the course, and we, uh, Xiao Wei and I uh, really hope you enjoy it. Um, so uh, I'm Nikki Rawnsley, my colleague Xiaowe Ding over there, she'll take over in a few minutes. Um, we're learning and teaching development advisors and we work for libraries and learning services. So part of what we do is help the law faculty with uh, academic and information literacies in their courses. Uh, so we are the team that look after the legal research component of Law 298 um, and as Bromwell would have said this morning, um, there's also the writing and communication component. So what I'll talk about now is just the legal research component of the course. So we'll go over the content and structure of this uh, component and just to make sure everyone's clear on exactly what's required. Um, and just uh, to remember that 20% of your mark for Law 298 will come from this legal research component. So it's good, probably um, a good time to get familiar with what you will be asked to do. So what do we mean when we say uh, research or legal research? Um, there's really no one definition, but we pretty much mean the process of seeking out material for the purpose of extending existing knowledge. So we all do this all the time, every day. So when we talk about legal research, we're talking about uh, research, that process of seeking out information uh, within the legal field to hopefully extend your knowledge and assist you with your uh, assignments. Uh, the, the basic point is that if you do not research, you cannot write. So whenever you're asked to do a piece of legal writing in any of your papers, it will always involve a first step of that legal research process. So the legal research component of Law 298 will start building those essential legal research skills. So we will look at uh, the legal research process. And this is the basic diagram that we follow. Um, and so for Law 298, we mostly uh, focus on the second step, which is the part where you will go out and consult primary and secondary sources for information. And then that information uh, you will then use to produce a piece of writing. So for your research to be successful, it's really important to follow a logical progression and do some planning before you jump into the databases. And that's a little bit of what will help you do uh, to be prepared before you sort of jump in uh, to find all this really useful information. And we will go through this diagram in more detail uh, in the first lecture in the first two weeks. 
So just to go through the structure of the legal research component, there's two parts basically. So weeks one and two, you will all come to a face-to-face -face lecture and Jawe and I will take you through a few basics and reiterate what's required uh, to pass the course, uh, the legal research component at least. Um, and there'll be five online modules and these you'll work through independently. In terms of the assessment, uh, you will have two online tests worth 10% each. Um, as I said, week one and two, you will have a face-to-face -face lecture, five online modules for independent study, two online tests worth 10% each. So the way the first two weeks will work is that you will have enrolled into a lecture time in both those weeks, but you do not need to come to two lectures. So you just need to come to one in one week or one in the other week. So the way it will work is if your surname begins with A to K, you need to come to your lecture time in week one. If your surname begins with L to Z, you need to come to your lecture time in week two. Okay, so it's, it's eight versions of the same lecture, so you do only need to come to one. So come to your enrolled time in the week that matches your surname. And just note, um, your booking in your uh, online timetable will say two hours. It should probably only take one hour. Okay, so a bit, a bit, of, bit of time back in your lives there. So that's the main thing to remember. So that's weeks, um, weeks one and two. For weeks three to six, there will be no classes, but you will be expected to be working through module one and module two of the online content as indiv independent study. Okay, so that's what you'll be doing weeks three to six. You'll have a wee break then, and from weeks seven and eight onwards, you'll start your regular fortnightly Law 298 classes, which you all will be enrolled with, and that will be the writing and communication part of the content. And then you'll also have modules three to five of the Legal Research Online component released during that time as well for independent study, okay? We'll go over this again next week and the week after in weeks one and two just to make sure everyone's clear. So in terms of the online modules, there will be five um, and they will be released at different times during semester one. Uh, these are the basic dates. If there's any changes to these release dates, we will let you know. We will also put an announcement on Canvas once a module is published and you'll be able to see it from that day onwards. So we'll remind you that way as well. Um, and so Canvas, the Law 298 Canvas page is the place to go to access the online modules. Each of the modules will contain videos and PDF documents and um, it's recommended that you work through all the material that's provided to you and you do this independently uh, just to make sure that you are all ready for the online tests which will assess uh, these online modules. Um, You'll need to schedule time to work on these outside of your other classes um, and from um, weeks seven and eight onwards, obviously you'll need to schedule time outside of your Law 28 classes as well. Um, so we recommend about two hours per module. That'll probably be about how long it takes you to work through the material and then practice the skills that um, those videos take you through. In terms of the assessments, as I said, two online tests worth 10% each. Online test one will be released to you on the 1st of April 8am and you can complete it uh, any time after that. It's due on the 7th of May 12 noon. It's accessible via Canvas, so that's where you will find the online tests. Now online test one will assess the skills learnt in modules one and two. So don't start online test one until you've done all the material in both module one and module two because you'll get questions relating to content from both the modules in that one test. Um, now it says online test one again, it should say online test two. Uh, that's released on the 27th of May, 8 a.m. And that is due the 2nd of August, 12 noon. So you've got quite a long time to work on online test two and practice the skills that you'll need to pass that one. Um, and that will assess skills learnt in modules three and four. And as I said, those tests, once they are released, will be uh, via, uh, accessible via Canvas. And we will put a uh, announcement out to let you know that the tests are now ready to start if you wish to. Just note that module five, which will be released quite late in semester one or the beginning of semester two, is not assessed. Okay, so it's still really useful content and will still be really useful to you, but it will not form part of the assessment. So it's modules one, two, three, and four that will be assessed. 
A little bit more information about those tests. Each test will have 10 questions. The questions are shuffled, so you will not get the same test as your friends. So um, there's no point sitting together with your computers and trying to do it together. You all will have different questions. Uh, we work very hard to create lots of questions so that um, it won't happen, uh, the two tests will be the same. You get two hours to complete the test. That's quite a long time. I would expect 20 to 40 minutes, depending on uh, how quick you work through. Uh, but you do have up to two hours. And you have two attempts at each test. So if the first attempt doesn't go quite so well and you want another go, you can have another go. And whichever mark is the highest will be the one that goes uh, towards your grade. Um, so do have another go if um, the first one isn't so good. Um, there are no extensions available for the online test, so it is important that you work through the modules, you do your practice, and then you complete the test by the due date, because we don't give extensions for those. Now at the end of each module, there will be uh, sort of practice questions that you can do once you've gone through the content, and we highly recommend that you take that opportunity to practice before doing the online test. So what you'll get in those practice tests will be very similar to what you see in the actual test. So a really good chance to make sure you've got all the skills down. I'll now pass over to Jawe, who's going to take you uh, through to the Canvas page to give you a look at how this all looks there. OK, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, congratulations on making it into part two. Um, I have to make it clear that um, uh, you won't see the, your course now because course has not been published. I'm going to show you a live demo and uh, we'll just in my um, login, so you will see the, just the unpublished uh, uh, mode. Oh, sorry. So this is my um, dashboard, trying to find, um, sorry, this is 298. So we need someone to click this button to publish it. So you, if you don't see it, don't panic. So you will, you will see it where, as soon as it's published. And on, your, on the left-hand side, and you got a navigation. Uh, you got modules here. So it's not visible yet. And if you click on modules, here are the modules we uh, were talking about. And you need to, this is only module one. Uh, under each modules, we have something. I'm just take one example here, laws of New Zealand. And uh, uh, we have learning objectives. So uh, after you watch the videos, you will achieve these learning objectives. You will see what you're going to achieve. And also, uh, if you up to here, if you click on the picture, you will see the video, right? You can see it's quite, <laughs> quite low. And also, we have some demo how teach you how to search in the database and you can minimize it if you don't want it if you click on the link you actually download a video it's mp4 <coughs> and should play well on your cell phone and also your uh, tablet and here we got some transcript if you need some transcript you can just click on the icon you will see the transcript straight away and if you want to download you can click on the link and again, you mi minimize it. And if you want to, after you watch the video, you want to jump into the practice yourself. And here we got the link. Uh, Laws of New Zealand is available in, on Lexis Advanced. So, so you can click on it and get into the database and practice uh, straight away. Uh, from this uh, module, from this section of the module, you can, you can go back to the module itself or you can click on this. Previous, you got into Dictionary of Law, and you can click on Next to navigate between the different sections of the module. All right? If I click on back to the modules, and you have a multiple sections within the module. And as Nikki said, remember to click on this Test Yourself. We haven't put anything yet, but this Test Yourself will contain uh, questions similar to the one in your real test. So this is a very good opportunity of practice uh, the similar question, not the same question, but the similar type of questions. So you'll see that. And as soon as we uh, put up uh, the quiz, and you should be able to access your quiz here under assignment. 
So here you'll, you'll have online test one, or you can access your quiz from uh, quizzes here. It's kind of gray. And after it published, it will become, you can click on here, there will be online test one. So from assignment and the uh, quizzes. Right. All right, uh, any questions about how to find the modules and the videos and the everything? Good. So uh, you're not studying in isolation. So we uh, also provide, we will provide some drop-in sessions and uh, we will advertise these sessions on Canvas. So please keep an eye on the, your announcement. And the sessions will happen in Belgali Computer Lab at the Davis Law Library. I think uh, some of you might be familiar with the lab. You go into the library and just on your right hand side. Um, so uh, pay attention to your uh, uh, announcement. So here got some uh, tips for uh, completing the course successfully. So make sure you work through all the modules and uh, uh, in independently uh, outside your class time, you have to use your, it, this is a self-paced uh, learning, so you can use your own time and at your own pace. And make sure you watch all the videos and make sure you schedule some time to practice on searching on database. And uh, um, practice um, using databases uh, via uh, using the test, test yourself questions, and you will see what type of questions in your real test. And if you have any question, you can just come along with your question to our drop-in sessions. Okay, that's pretty much about us. Any questions? Well, good. Yes. Week one next week. Yeah. Okay. Week one is next next week. <laughs> Just checking. Yeah. So weeks like. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, so. If there's one person you should know while you're here at law school, it's Clodagh. I, I kid you not. So this, this is a fantastic place. We've talked all about the stuff that you learn in class. But at the end of the day, most of you are here to get a kick-ass job and have some success in that job, whatever that success might look out like. Um, and it doesn't matter how good your grades are, you will not get that success unless you prepare outside of the classroom as well. Um, and Clodagh is your key to doing that. So um, we've got a session from Clodagh on how you can start thinking about stuff now. I have known Kaya for quite a while, um, and I'm very proud to see what Kaya is achieving in his professional life. It's always amazing to see. So I am Claudia Higgins, and I am the Employer Engagement Manager. I've actually had a job title since you saw me last year. I'm now Career Development and Employer Engagement Manager. Um, so uh, who am I? Um, so Career Development Manager, you're very lucky. I am still the only me in New Zealand. We are the only law school that has a dedicated career service within the faculty. So my advice to you is use it. The amount of students that go through their degree and only start thinking about their career towards the end, it's almost too late. You'll be stressed, you'll struggle. Come see me early. I'm really helpful and I'm quite nice. OK, <laughs> we did this last year. So you're probably looking at me going, are you that lazy that you didn't update your slides? No. Um, I just want to do another check-in. So I'm going to read out three career statements, and we're going to do the standy up, be city down thing. So I'm going to read the three out, and then we're going to ask you back, and you're going to stand up with the one you most agree with. I want to be a lawyer, and the LLB program is how I get to do that. I'm thinking about being a lawyer, but willing to keep my options open. <coughs> I have absolutely no intention of being a lawyer, but I know that the LLB degree is a great degree to have, and my parents may have made me do it. <laughs> okay, statement one. Stand up if you definitely 100% want to be a lawyer, and you know this is the way to do it. Oh, I think that's gone down from last year. <laughs> okay, sit down. I'm thinking about being a lawyer, but willing to keep my options open. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay, you guys can sit down. Oops. I have absolutely no intention of being a lawyer. Gary, sit down. Um, but I know that the LLB degree is a great degree to have, slash my parents are making me be here. Yeah, I think, I think that's, yeah. Anything else? Okay. I accept and acknowledge all your stances on life so far, but stay open. Um, keep your blinkers off while you're at law school. Take every opportunity to find out about being a lawyer or being one of the million other things you can do with a law degree. But it's your job to educate yourself. No one else can take responsibility for you. Okay, quiz time. So once again, you've been sitting for a while. There's only so much wisdom I can depart to you in 10 minutes, so we might as well make it a bit of fun and get the blood going again. <laughs> okay, this is one of those ones. So you stand up if you agree with the statement. Everyone got that? It's not what you know, it's who you know. Stand up if you agree. Okay, sit down. Okay. False but. There is a but. Um, sure, it's not, th there is some meritocracy coming out of here, but use the time you have at law school to meet as many people from the industry you're choosing to go into. The law school bends itself backwards, bringing you practitioners to lecture. I bring in so many practitioners, I'm sick of the sight of them by the end of the year. It is your responsibility to get out of your comfort zone, make time in your timetable to come meet these people. When people come to the law school, they really want to talk to you. They want to help and they want to depart their knowledge. So utilize every opportunity you can to grow your networks. And when I say the word networking, law students go, <laughs> it's not that scary. It's having a genuine conversation with someone. It's not a, you have job, I want job, give me the job. <laughs> okay, question number two. A law degree has a limited number of career paths. Stand up if you agree. Oh, you guys are good. Yeah. 100% false. You can do whatever you want, essentially. Um, while you're at law school, there are some conversations that happen that you have to get into certain types of law, or you have to do this, or you have to do that. Do whatever you want, is my life advice. But think about how you're going to get there. And also remember, if you're a school leaver, you probably have at least 45 years of working in front of you. Four and a half decades, to put that. <laughs> You have plenty of time to achieve as many career objectives as you want. So keep your mind open. And also, this whole thing that we've been talking about, but no one really knows what it means. We don't know what the future's going to hold. If you told my parents when they were in first year that we'd have the internet, they would have been very confused. <laughs> what? So we just send these messages on a computer, and that's a formal way of communicating? What? So we don't know what the future's going to hold. So what we need from you guys is going to change. OK. I am guaranteed a job straight out of law school. Stand up if you agree. <laughs> Sorry, but false. Yeah, look, you guys have to work hard, but you will get there. You are smart. You have a law degree from Auckland Law School, but you have to work while you're here as well as working on your degree. OK, what do you think employers look for from law graduates? Anyone want to hazard a guess? Yep. Yes, that's a good one. Care, you want to pipe in? You hire. Yep. <laughs> what do you want from these guys? Tell us. Uh, I put him on the spot. I did not warn him I was going to do this. So. All I will say is that phrase is not enough. Yes, I would agree. Yep. People skills. People skills. Yes, absolutely. Lawyers deal with people. Anything else? Okay, here's a list. Just write them down. Analytical thinking, problem solving, initiative, communication, a passion for what they do. That's the big one. If you can showcase to them, they know you know nothing when you work, start working with them. They want you to be passionate about what they do. They'll teach you that, they'll train you, but they want to make sure you've the right mindset, you've the right passion, and everything else will fall into place. Okay, what to do while you're studying? Maintain your grades, but make sure you do other stuff. Now, you're probably thinking, I've been sitting here for less than two hours and they're already going on about grades. That doesn't mean it has to be this magical number that seems to circulate around the law school. Just do the best that you can do. Be proud of the grade you get. 
Not everyone is an A plus student, that's absolutely fine, but make sure you're doing the very best you can do. The other stuff is what we call the co-curriculars, the stuff that happens outside the classroom, whether it be your church, whether it be your football club, whether it be a um, club of society, you gotta get involved. Educate yourself on your career. Your last semester is too late. I'm actually not that helpful. It's usually a panicked, crying conversation. You need to start thinking about it now. You don't need to make a decision now, but you need to start thinking about it. Get involved. There's a reason why everyone says this. You've probably heard this a few times already this morning. A, it's fun. B, you make friends. C, it's good for your mental well-being, but also it gives you great transferable soft skills. Get some work experience, volunteer, an internship, a summer clerkship. These words probably all sound quite technical and foreign, but get involved. Uh, make sure you get some experience while you're here. Grow your networks. Okay, that's me. One shout out, and um, we're doing the pop-up moot event at, again this year. So we partner with the Pop-Up Globe and we do this incredibly fun event where the Pop-Up Globe actors run around and create a scene and then students moot the legal problem. It's a really fun event, but you also get to meet practitioners. Last year, we brought in a bunch of QCs, we brought in a load of lawyers from Anthony Harper, and they were dying to talk to students. So not only is it a really fun event, you get to see a moot, you get to meet lots of practitioners. So make sure you go, and it makes me look good. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Oh, you can come whenever you want. Um, I am very busy in March. So if you're a stage two, I'd rather you waited until after March because a lot of our penultimate year students are getting ready for summer Clark application. Um, but the sooner you see me, the better. I'm rather fierce and mean when you first meet me. And I will say, what have you been doing your entire life? But that's okay. It's because I see so many students. And we can go through your CV and I can point out bits that maybe need to develop a bit more. Yep. Any other questions? No. Yep. Oh yes, please take it all down. Um, so how you RSVP is by emailing lawstudentengagement at auckland.ac.nz. You can bring as many people as you want, essentially. If you want to bring a friend or a partner or a family member, that's A-OK. -okay. And there's beer and pizza at the end. Any other questions? No? All good. All right. Um, speaking of co-curricular stuff, who's uh, heard of Auckland Law Review? You guys, I, I was trying to figure out where I saw this Nick's name from. Um, and I think the last time I, I finally registered, the last time I uh, saw Gary, I think um, I was singing a Kendrick Lamar song at Sky City and you might not have had all your clothes on. Um, <laughs> Gary Hoffman, everybody. Um, hi everyone, uh, as you can see by the screen behind me, my name is Gary Hoffman um, and I am a law student. Oh, there's a podium, there we are. Um, well done for getting into part two, huge achievement. I remember when I received notice that I got into part two, I was in the middle of the bush in South Africa and I was like whooping and my dad was like, shut up, look above you. And there was a boom slung in the tree above us sleeping. So like, fun story. <laughs> Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> with, with a little bit about me, um, I'm in the final semester of my degree and I'm, thank you, oh, stop it. <laughs> um, I am so excited to finish. Um, I also did an arts degree majoring in drama and history. Um, besides uni, I'm involved with my community. I'm involved with other co-curricular stuff. Um, I'm involved in the Auckland theatre scene. Um, and when I was asked to talk to you today, I thought to myself, um, what do I wish I learned from this here had I turned up? Because um, I didn't come to this when I was in part two. Um, so I've got nine handy tips um, for you. I couldn't think of a tenth. I was also convinced ten is like, has a hegemony over numbers. So nine handy tips. Um, and I'm sure you've actually heard a lot of these. Um, I wasn't listening to most of what you've been hearing, so I'm so sorry if I'm just giving you the same spiel again. 
Um, number one, complacency is your worst enemy. Um, too many times people come into part two and they're sort of like, oh, I'm in now, so they can't really kick me out. Um, false. <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, the hard work doesn't stop here. Um, it, is, it is not time now to, to stop working just because you're in. Um, in, in fact, now that you're in, you want to start to do even better. Um, this, is, this is when employers will start to look at these subjects, your core subjects, your part two subjects. They're um, e extremely important for um, laying the foundations for your electives. Um, so make sure that you continue working really hard. Um, second tip, don't disregard your other degree. Um, I'm sure a lot of you guys are doing conjoins, right? Yeah? I see a few vacant nods, which is like, yes. Um, your other degree can be a huge point of difference for you. Um, up until a few years ago, I was the only person in New Zealand doing a drama conjoin with law. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, but on top of that, it can be really, really helpful with what you're studying. Um, it can lay other foundations for what you're learning if you're doing history. A lot of what we cover is the history of the law in our subjects. Um, and on top of that, there are other amazing networks and um, facilities in the other schools that can help you out. Um, on top of that, it also somewhat becomes recreational at a point. Um, it did for me. I, I told us the other day as well. Um, I used to um, read my law readings. Uh, no, no, I still do read my law readings, but I'm sorry. <laughs> I, um, when I was reading my law readings, I would um, sort of read five pages of my law readings and as a reward I'd let myself read a history reading, which sounds awfully nerdy, because it is, but um, it, was, it was really nice to have something else to go back to because sometimes law school can become a bit monotonous. Um, big word. Um, <laughs> and um, so... Um, don't disregard it, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, number three, which I know you've probably heard a lot, get involved with things. Um, apply for everything, I mean, everything. It's really fun. Um, I could tell you what you would expect to hear. You'll make great friends for life and it'll look great on your CV, but there are things on top of that that applying for everything and, and doing co-curriculars, um, the benefits of them become quite obvious when you do them. Um, so yes, it's true. You'll make great friends and, and it'll look great on your CV, but um, you will also have a sort of well-being network set up for you if you join these co-curriculars because when, oh, when shite hits the fan, um, <laughs> it's nice to have a group of people that you can be with um, who are also going through the same experiences as you. Um, and... I want to caveat something. Um, rejection is fine. Rejection is human. It's normal. Um, life goes on, and, and it, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't apply for things again. Um, a lot of the times when people get a no, they think, oh, that's it. My life's over. I can't do anything else. But um, that's not true. If you, if you get a rejection letter, if you, if you receive a no, um, what you do after that is really what matters. If you continue to apply and then you get in after being rejected, it's, it's a huge show of resilience and it's, it's a huge show of really wanting to be involved. Um, I can give you an example for me. Um, when I was in my third year, I, third year? Third year. I applied to um, be elected onto AULSS, which you'll hear about more a bit later. I wanted to, myself and a friend, we wanted to be the educational vice presidents of AULSS, so we put ourselves up for elections. We lost terribly. We like, like there were like 300 votes to like 18. Like, like I'm saying like we got smashed. It was, um, it was, it was embarrassing. Um, but you know what, the next year, myself and another friend, um, <laughs> another friend because the friend that I applied with the first time was on exchange, <laughs> throw it out there, but um, we, we applied to be um, EVPs the next year and, and this time we smashed everyone else. Um, and so I think 
some key points to take from that is we were showing a real commitment to the role. Um, people definitely saw that. Um, they saw that um, there was reapplication. They saw that we we genuinely wanted. We don't, didn't want it for the wrong reasons, um, and that makes a huge difference in, in a lot of people's eyes. Number four, um, don't struggle in silence. Uh, this is a really really important one. Um, our mental well being is is extremely important to us personally. Um, there's a lot of ums happening. Uh, something to point out to you guys. Everybody is entitled to six free sessions with the university counselors a year. It's like, it's like a coffee card, you get six and they'll like kind of stamp it. Um, use that resource. It is super, super, super important that you use that resource if you need it. Don't bottle it up. Um, the the counselors are, are amazing. They, they can help you with literally anything. Well, with a lot of things. Um, they can do the simplest practical things. They can help you make a study calendar or a guide, or they can just be people to talk to if you're feeling really down. Use the service. Don't struggle in silence. Make sure you tell someone. Number five, this wasn't around when I was in part two. There's a note bank. If you are on the AULSS page, go into the details section. There's a, a link, it takes you to a Google Drive. The note bank is incredible. It is a resource that has past people's notes. Um, something that you might have heard is, is at law school, it's kind of about who you know. This, this resource was created to, to mitigate that. Um, you no longer need to know an older student to get past notes. The note bank is there so that everybody can access things and everyone can be on a level playing field. It is an amazing resource. Do not think that just because you have past notes that you don't need to make your own notes or you don't need to go to class. That's not true. Made that mistake. Um, <laughs> seriously, it's, it's, very, it's a very great resource, but it's a resource to be used in moderation. Number six, open book exams are not as easy as they seem. I wish I knew this one as well. Um, you guys all in part one would have only had closed book exams, right? No. You had an open book exam? We had one. Oh, I didn't do that one. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just, what did I do? It's okay. There it is. Don't worry. In any case, open book exams are not as easy as they seem. Um, you are no longer expected to know knowledge. You should have the knowledge in front of you. Uh, you. You won't get applauded for knowing the knowledge. Rather, what they are testing you on is the harder stuff, which is analysis. Do not be fooled by open book exams. Don't think that you can just go in with an open book and not have actually used the notes. You want to study with those notes. You want to know how to use those notes, how to navigate those notes. If you make the notes yourself, you probably won't even need the open book. Um, I've, I've done that before, you know, made a full set of notes. It's been like hundreds of pages, printed them all out, and I haven't opened it in an exam. And, and like, I mean, waste of paper, but also like <laughs> great knowledge. <laughs> Number seven, utilize all your other resources. I keep on coming back to this utilize your resources. So this is kind of like a general utilize your resources. Um, I spend so much time in Clodagh's office, it's not funny. <laughs> like. Like, I'm kind of like that stain that you just can't get rid of. <laughs> no, um, that wasn't funny. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, if you're planning to do something like careers, an exchange, if you need an extension, if you're just feeling down, go to the student center. It's, it's incredible. Um, if you just need a yarn, go to the student center. I do that all the time. Use those resources. On top of that, the Dave is there to be used. Um, the Davis is sort of like that scary building with all the books in it. Um, I didn't go into it for like a year, <laughs> which was <laughs> probably not great. But um, books are in there. If you guys have like prescribed textbooks, you could buy them, but that's expensive. Um, they're in the Dave. So make sure that you, you use the Dave. And with Law 298, you'll, you'll be taught how to navigate through the wild world that is the Dave. Number eight, be friendly, not competitive. 
really, really, really important. Um, it's, it's, it's actually quite fundamental. I mean, talk, Clodo was talking before about um, making networks in law school. You're not going to do that if you aren't friendly. Uh, it's just a fact. Um, my first day of, of university, I came to my first lecture and I was wearing this shirt and it said, I'm in shape, round as a shape. Great shirt. <laughs> I gave it to my dad after the story though. Um, and, and I went up to this guy and I was like, hi, my name's Gary, it's lovely to meet you. I knew no one else, in the, well, I didn't even know this guy in the class. And um, the guy looked me up and down and was like, hmm, and just walked away and moved seats. <laughs> Haven't seen him again, so who's the winner? <laughs> but like, that is a really, really good example of how to not make friends. <laughs> uh, and I've made friends since then. Uh, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, yeah. Great story. Eh? It's always, everyone's always like, what a great story. <laughs> great. Uh, it's really important that you find your people as well. Um, your people could be your closest friends at law school, but also your people might be different people in different contexts. My closest friends are awful to study with. I always get the side eye when they text me like, we're gonna study, and I'm like, I'm not gonna come. <laughs> and I'll, they'll like catch me with another group studying. It's like, <gasps> jacuzzi, yeah. <laughs> No, um, so sometimes, sometimes your closest friends are really not productive. Make sure that you find a group of people to study with that are, are going to be the right people to study with. Kind of. And then finally, number nine, which is, is a very important one to me, don't get caught up in the commercial web. Um, very few people actually, well, I think, very few people come into law school with the intention of being a commercial lawyer. Um, I think that most people come in with like, absolutely amazing intentions. They want to do really, really good work for, for people. And I'm, I'm not saying commercial law is not good work for good people. I'm just saying a lot of people come in with this common narrative of I want to do things for the environment or I want to do human rights or international law. Um, uh, but after a few years, you think that com law is the only option that's available for you. That's not true. Uh, it's absolutely false. There are other opportunities. If you want to do crim or you want to do human rights or environmental law or international law or any of the other um, any of the other vocations that are on this list five miles long, do them. If you don't want to be a lawyer, don't be a lawyer. It's it's as simple as that. You know, it might be it might be a bit more work if you want to do a vocation that's outside of those conventional areas um, of, of work. But that doesn't mean that the opportunity isn't there and, and you should really seize that opportunity. It, it's another awesome point of difference. Everybody's unique and I, I, I really highly doubt that everybody in this room wants to be a commercial lawyer. Am I wrong? <laughs> Anyway, that, that is nine pieces of advice from Gary Hoffman, B-A-L-L-B. -L -L <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions? I know that it's um, a lot easier to ask someone who is currently a student a question about law school than it is to ask someone who is not currently a student. What was your favourite course? My favourite course? I, it was this summer, I did summer school. Woo. Uh, <laughs> And I did a course called Contemporary Issues of Disarmament Law, taken by Tressa Dunworth. Incredible course, such a good course. Looking at um, international law around bombs and weapons and real cool stuff. Uh, yeah. Is this the end of your next Yeah, sure. Um, what is your end game? Like, what's, where to next for you? <laughs> Um, <laughs> great question. Uh, no, no, no. I, I'm actually doing my honours in theatre next year. Oh, this year. Uh, this year. Um, so after I finish my honours in theatre, I have done an internship at an organisation called Equity New Zealand, which is a trade union for actors. They are a subsidiary of another organisation called the Media Entertainment Arts Al Alliance which is in Australia, and I'm in talks with a person from Equity about trying to gain some sort of employment opportunity within the entertainment industry 
somehow utilizing my degree. Yeah. Any other questions? I love talking about me. <laughs> Nah, go. Cool. Okay, great. Good luck, guys. I guarantee none of your lectures will be that exciting. Um, <laughs> so it's all downhill. No, I'm kidding. Um, hey, look, a bit of a serious. So the next um, session is titled. Oh, before we do that, stand up. Cool. So, um, a lot of people have told you during various parts of the day that you should go and talk to the lovely ladies at the uh, Student Centre. So, can I please put you on the spot? On the spot? Can you stand up? Um, so, Saranjika manages the team. Y you will have a very tough time at law school if you don't see them. Um, and I mean that in, in all seriousness. Um, if you are having issues with getting assignments done, whether, as Gary said, you just need a chat, uh, we need help in whatever form, um, talk to the guys over here at the Student Centre. They have specific roles as well, okay, and they're all up there on the board um, for you to have a look at, but there's specific people you can go see, um, depending on the type of help you need. All good? Cool. Thank you. Give them a round of applause. So, our next session, a safe, inclusive and supportive law school for all. Um, I don't work here, so I can say some stuff. Um, you may have all um, heard of stuff going on in the industry, right, over the last maybe two, two three years ago. Um, and I am absolutely so proud to be in an organisation that has some pretty strong views of what is happening and of what we can do to make sure that our graduates um, are armed with the right information, the right experiences to make sure that when they get into industry, that they are the type of people that should be in the industry as well. Um, so Professor uh, Julia told me, you've seen it before, but she's going to come and talk a little bit about what we're doing at this um, law school to make sure that we get that and we nail it well. Cool. Thank you. Kia ora again. Um, I'm speaking to you, of course, now in my uh, capacity as well-being convener at the law school. Um, and you're also going to hear from the Associate Dean Equity, Carrie Leonetti. So one of the things that we've done um, in the well-being space is we've done some um, big surveys of people's experiences at the law school. So there was the gender report which uh, Dr Anna Hood and myself wrote and there was the wellbeing surveys done by Dr um, Claire Charters um, and they revealed, surprise surprise, that the law school experience can be a very stressful and lonely one for a lot of people. So I'm here with a couple of key messages about that. The first is that you're not alone if you're having issues I mean, I think this is probably a theme right throughout the talks this morning. Don't keep it to yourself. Reach out. There's a list of people to contact depending on what it is you're dealing with, whether they're academic concerns, financial concerns, careers concerns, well-being issues, um, or equity concerns. And you'll see the appropriate people in the front page of every casebook. There'll be a list of people that you can contact. Um, so you've met our fabulous student uh, services team, our career support person. I hope you've had information on our financial hardships grants. We have a very good health and counselling service at the university. One thing to be aware of, sometimes it can be hard to get in, particularly at stressful times in the year. If you're having a crisis, Saranjika has a fast track process into that counselling service, so she should be your first port of call. Um, we also have a process for bullying, harassment and discrimination and there's a link to those policies and also an overview of the complaints process at, again at the front of every casebook that you have. Um, in addition to our Associate Dean Equity and our Associate Dean for Māori Students, uh, Dr Fleur Te Aho and our Associate Dean Pacifica, um, Associate Professor Trussa Dunworth, we have a range of other faculty members who are targeted for particular student groups, so a faculty advisor for students with disabilities, Karen Fairweather, the faculty advisor for LGBTI students, Jane Kelsey and Ron Patterson, the faculty advisor to students from refugee backgrounds, Dr Anna Hood, the faculty advisor to students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, Kate Doolin, 
the faculty advisor to students who are parents, myself, and to women students again, Anna Hood. If it's too hard to reach out to someone on the list, uh, reach out to someone you actually know and trust. Someone on the professional staff, an academic staff member that you have a particular rapport with, or another student who can segue you into the appropriate channel. Um, one of the things as New Zealanders we struggle with is admitting uh, that we're not coping. There's a real sense of shame attached to it, but I'm here to tell you there's no shame attached. The profession actually needs sensitive people. Um, it needs people who are real and who understand the struggle of being a human being. My second uh, message is that there are many different ways of being successful. I really liked what Gary was saying about this. One of the most personally uh, discouraging things for me about reading, writing the gender report um, was realising that we took an incredibly brilliant bunch of young people, you, um, and how many were actually feeling really stupid or second rate because they weren't getting A grades and they didn't think they were going to get an offer from a large commercial downtown law firm. I think that's an incredibly impoverished vision of success something that's tied up with grades or an offer for these commercial firms. I'm here to tell you, I did get an offer from a commercial firm, worst professional experience I personally ever had. <laughs> I discovered about myself that I'm not good at the combination of being bored and stressed. <laughs> bored and relaxed, stressed and challenged, I can cope with. I also discovered I have a strong sense of social justice. I thought it was going to be enough for me to have sharp pinstripe suits, a convertible MG, a fabulous downtown pad. I thought that I cared about these things and I discovered I didn't. I'm not particularly materialistic. So I think you really need to sort of get to know yourself and it's okay to have false starts in that process. Think about what you stand for um, and what kind of contribution you want to make. Allow yourself a journey of discovery around that. A few years back, I had Sandra Alofi Vai and Laverne King come in to talk about to my woman in the law course, um, and they talked about the firm that they set up as young Māori and Pacifica women. So they struggled to get employment, they scraped into employment. I think Sandra talks about having a job that just paid her bus fare to and from her employment. Um, and then they lost their jobs after a couple of years for reasons that were no fault um, of their own. And one of their employers who was going overseas for several years provided them with the capital and security to start their own firm. Um, he's now Judge Philip Recorden, a pretty extraordinary uh, man. And they set up a firm and their mission was to employ other Māori, young Māori and Pacifica women graduates and give them a couple of years experience so they could then go on and set up their own firms. And so tons of little law firms have come out of this particular firm. That was what they stood for. Not only that, they decided they wanted it all, professional success and motherhood. So they set up a creche in their own law firm. They were one of the first firms um, to actually do that. So that is extraordinary success for me. And it's not measured by the fact that they got, um, well, they didn't get downtown offers from large law firms or A grades, necessarily. Humans at the Law School is a project that we um, are doing in the wellbeing space at the moment, which is trying to give people a sense of connection, insight to others at the Law School, inspiration, a sense that people with successful careers have failures. Failures are part of success. The most successful people have the most failures. They're just people that focus on those, try and learn from those failures. They're not scared to take risks. So our aim as part of this project is to introduce people as human beings and give you insight into them, what makes them tick, what their passion and vision is, um, the hardships that they've overcome. So we do Instagram postings, we do posters around the law school, there are some fantastic videos, Sandra Lofivai is on one of our videos, Naomi Nef Tefari has just been, had a video loaded on, an incredibly inspiring um, story if you need some inspiration to go and have a look at. Um, so we want stories about you, if you have an, a, an interesting story, not your CV, not your achievements, who you are as a person, um, please contact uh, Martina. Martina, is she here? Oh, she's just popped out, unfortunately. Contact Martina, here's her email. 
um, if, you, if you're interested in that. We have lots of wellbeing initiatives um, going on around the law school, including a fantastic student wellbeing group who champion wellbeing at the school. They organise mentoring programmes, events and study groups. Um, and I just got contacted by one um, who was telling me that there are going to be a series of open discussion forums in the cafe on different aspects of a law student's year beginning in week three, where part two students get to ask part past part two students um, questions about study habits and law school cultural life and all the things you might want to know to have a balanced life. Here's Martina here. <laughs> um, to assist you in having an easier and less stressful transition into the law school by giving you connection and a, a real life forum in which to be able to ask questions that actually matter. Okay, without much ado, I'm going to hand over now to Carrie, who is our Associate Dean Equity. Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Kia ora, talofa, and warm Pacific greetings. I feel the need to add an extra one on. Um, I am sure by now you have been both welcomed and congratulated all morning long, but I'm still going to welcome you to part two and congratulate you on the extraordinary achievement of getting into law school. Um, I am the Associate Dean of Equity for the Law School. Um, that means that my job is, along with everyone else on the slide that Julia showed you, um, is to promote the law school's equity goals, um, to develop programs to enhance equity at the law school, um, and to sort of enforce and design metrics for making sure that we are achieving those equity goals. Um, this, of course, I think leads to an obvious question, which is what is equity? Um, I really actually had to think about that because that's not a word that we use in this space in America. Um, so what, what does it mean to promote equity at the law school? Um, and really what it means is that my mission, the mission of all the other colleagues I have that work at equity, and the mission of everyone in this room, because you are now a member of this community, um, is to really try to make the law school a safe, inclusive, and supportive space um, for everybody. That's really what we mean when we talk about equity. Um, sometimes I conceive of my job in terms of no's and yeses. That's probably the lawyer in me. Um, so this means no discrimination, no hate speech, no bullying. Um, and that goes for students and staff of the law school with one another. Um, and it means yes to creating safe spaces and equal opportunities from people who come to this law school with all kinds of backgrounds and needs and prior experiences. Um, the university identifies sort of official specific equity groups, which really are just groups of people who have historically been underrepresented in institutions of power, um, including universities and, of course, the practice of law and government. Um, so at the top of the list usually are Maori staff and students, although to be clear, Maori are not an equity group, right? Maori are the indigenous inhabitants of this land and their partners um, in the government under the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, also, um, students from Pacific Islands, um, students with disabilities, students who are LGBTQIA, I'm not sure that's the acronym you use in New Zealand, but you get the idea, um, students from refugee backgrounds, students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, um, students who are non-traditional because they are, if not mature, at least a little bit older, because they're parents, because they're carers, um, and even women, right? Women are a majority of people in the world. They are traditionally quite a majority of students at the law school, um, but are nonetheless historically underrepresented from the law. Um, and so I'm really just here today, in addition to introducing myself and, and the other colleagues who work to promote equity at the law school, um, to sort of ask all of you to join in the equity goals. Um, you're consumers of equity at this law school, but you're also producers of equity at this law school, hopefully. Um, so one of the things to think about is to be aware of your privilege. Um, I really don't care how underprivileged your background was. Welcome to part two. You're on your way to becoming a lawyer, which gives you access to incredible power and privilege. What we do at this law school is teach you to speak a language. It is the language of power in society. So you are now the person who can understand the language that is often a barrier to access to everyone who can't. And there are obligations that come with that. Um, I guess if you fail out, I'll let you off the privilege lecture. But otherwise, if you successfully proceed through law school, you have become a member of a really privileged minority in society. Um, 
So just be aware of that. Be aware that people come here with really different backgrounds, really different experiences with privilege and power, um, and use sort of the power that you gain access to here wisely and fairly and inclusively. Um, the other thing is if you feel like you need better access, you need better integration, like you're not having the same opportunity as other students at the law school, um, please reach out. We actually have lots of support, but it does rely on students to speak up when their needs aren't being met. So there are official support programs, mentoring and tutorials for students from certain equity groups. Um, there are student advisors, you're gonna meet in a minute, the student equity officers who I'm going to introduce to you. Um, and there are student groups, and those student groups can provide all kinds of peer support for people who maybe are having trouble feeling like they have full access to the experience at the law school. Um, student, other sort of students in student groups are a great source of social support, pastoral support, but also career networking. It's not who you know in a sort of backroom nepotistic way, but it absolutely is the networks you build for yourself. Um, so I'm almost 20 years out of law school now, and I have definitely at least gotten into the room for the interview because of somebody that I networked with in law school. Not, again, in some back room deal sense, but because they knew my background, they knew my commitment and my passion, and employers do care about that. When, when I said, this is what I want to do for a living, they could say, yeah, that is what Carrie wants to do for a living, and it at least gets you into the room. So rely on each other for those networks. Um, this is a huge law school. You're not all going to stay in touch and have reunions every year, I don't think, when you leave here, but you will find a core p of students here at the law school with whom you share a lot of various commonalities, um, and you will actually be in touch with each other for the rest of your life. So start building those networks of peer support now. Um, there are also sort of specific student groups. There's Terra Cauture, which is the More student group, um, Pilsa, Rainbow Law, Women in Law. Um, so reach out to those groups if you are members of those groups or if you're allies of members of those groups. Um, they're important peer support networking programs. And finally, ask. If you need some kind of accommodation, um, if you need resources that haven't been provided to you or you can't figure out how to find them, ask anyone on that page. Um, I didn't, I was going to put my email on my office on a slide for you. I didn't because there's an equity page at the law school and I thought, ooh, I want to make you all go to the equity page. So if you go to the, the law school's equity webpage, there's contact information for me, for all of the faculty advisors and conveners, um, student advisors that you're going to meet today and who work in in this space, um, but reach out to any of us and ask. Um, part of my job is not just sort of to enforce equity goals, it's to advocate for students who are not finding inclusion and access at the law school. Um, so please avail yourself of all of us because we really care about making this a safe, welcoming, and inclusive place. So with that, one last time, congratulations. Um, as of Monday morning, good luck. Um, have a wonderful sort of first real great year at law school. Um, and with that, are the, are the student equity officers here? I wear bifocals. I'm not very good at Oh, you're right there. Diana's right there. OK. Um, is Anusha here? OK. So I'm going to introduce you to Diana Q, who is one of your student equity officers. Kia ora everyone, my name is Diana and I am a fifth year law and art student with majors in economics and French and together with my fellow colleague, friend and also student Anusha are your student equity officers at law school for this year. You've heard from Carrie that she and Julia manage the staff side um, of equity and equity at the law school generally. And the student equity officers are the people who, like you, are students and another resource that you can reach out to if you are looking for somebody to talk to or to bring a equity concern uh, that you have to us. So over the next couple of minutes, uh, and I'll keep this very short, I'm just going to chat to you about what the student equity officer position is and what some of our general responsibilities are. So first, what the position is, is that we're basically students and we look after your equity uh, concerns at the law school, as well as advocate generally for some of the systemic equity issues that underpin your law school experience. So those equity 
the concerns might look like issues pertaining to your well-being. They may look like incidents you encounter throughout your law school experience in the form of discrimination, harassment, assault and bullying. And if those are incidents that happen to you or somebody that you know, you are welcome to get into contact with either Anusha or I. Uh, we will keep your uh, accounts and incidences anonymous and do the best we can to help you with that if you feel most comfortable chatting to a student. So some of our general responsibilities can be seen up on the slide behind me. The first, I've um, addressed this before, is hearing independent student concerns. The second is fostering relationships between the different equity groups that exist at law school. After me, you're going to hear from some of the leaders of those equity groups, and our responsibility as student equity officers is to foster relationships between them in order to address equity concerns on a broader macro level. Third, we advocate generally for systemic issues that we see addressing the law school uh, as a more general responsibility. And finally, we also run events that help to increase the knowledge of equity concerns at the law school, including, for example, mental health hooies. We help to organise Substantive Equality Month, which happens in semester two, as well as Cultural Month in semester one, which is coming up in May, I think. We are contactable on the email that you see there, lawequityofficer at gmail.com. It's also posted in the description of the ULSS Facebook group. Uh, Anusha, cannot be here today at the uh, moment, but for those of you who are going to camp, you will see her there. I am also a student. I am in my final year, so I understand the law school journey and how stressful it can be, and I just want to reassure you that there are plenty of resources here, including us, that can help you with that journey as well. So if you have any questions, I'll be lingering around the law school uh, during the barbecue coming up, so you can approach me then and ask me any questions then. Thank you very much. So, um, in true law school fashion, we're um, gone over time, um, but that's all good. Uh, one session left, and we've just got a bunch of student reps. Do you guys want to yeah, come, come down? Uh, we're going to do a quick fire plug from a number of different student organisations, just to talk to you about who they are, what they do, and why you should be interested. Quick fire plug, and then we'll close up. Thank you. Kia ora everyone, my name's Lena and I am president of AULSS. Now who here knows what AULSS stands for? Anyone want to give it a go? Yep. Auckland University Law Student Society. Absolutely, there we go. Woo! So we are um, Auckland University Law Student Society. Since 1971, we have been an organisation led by students for students. Yes, we hold big events like the Ball Law Camp, which is tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> We have the barbecue today, as well as different Stein social events, networking opportunities and whatnot. However, at the end of the day, we're here as your advocates and your representative. So if you do have any concerns, if you do want to see some sort of change within the student body, within AULSS, you want to voice something um, about uh, the law to the law faculty, we're the first point of contact. Um, so in terms of events, our first kind of networking opportunity that you have is on the 14th of March. We have a recruitment series day where firms, representatives will come and would like to speak to the students about the different cultures, the values that they hold. So that will be all on AULSS and we have a Facebook event for that as well. We've got one for big firms and small firms coming up. But aside from the different events, and we've also got a Stein coming up on the 11th of March. So once again, um, join the AULSS page. But at the end of the day, um, I just want to remind you two things. Firstly, don't compare yourself to others. Your law school journey, it's given me a very uh, full-on next three, four years or so, um, five even. 
But yeah, don't compare your notes, your grades, expectations with others. Um, find your why as to why you're studying he- uh, this degree, as to why you're here in New Zealand's um, most prestigious law school. And also open, be open in terms of uh, networking, friendships, try out new opportunities, new competitions and moots that you've never done before. Because every event you go to, you'll meet at least one new person. And that new person um, is what will make your law journey an enjoyable, exciting one. So once again, I'll see you guys at the barbecue in about 10 minutes or so at the law school be careful when you're crossing the road because it is quite rush traffic um, sign up for AULSS $20 membership if you have already signed up um, still queue up to get your AULSS stickers and for those of you coming to camp see you then and I'll see you around at law school thank you I'll just make this real brief. I'm uh, gathering you guys have been here for several hours now. So, oh. um, I'm Lauren and I'm the Advocacy Officer for Women in Law. Um, our president is actually still overseas and she sends her apologies. She couldn't make it today. Um, we're a student society created a couple of years um, in response to the gender report, which is by Julia Tommy and Anna Hood. Um, and the whole thing is we want to have a diverse range of events so that basically girls can meet other girls and just you can make better friends because law school is actually real hard but if you have friends it makes it just so much more bearable. We have an event coming up called Girls Night In and this event over the last couple of years has been a bit of a fan favourite because we have great platters, great mocktails, great cocktails and wine. So if you like wine and cheese, please come along. Who doesn't have a free feed? Um, it's free to join. We'll be at the barbecue. Ask us questions, sign up. It's a good time. All right, see you guys. Hi guys, um, salam, namaste, sasrikal, and kiora. We are the South Asian Law Students Association, or SALSA as we like to say it, and we just want to congratulate you for getting into law school first of all. I'm Haya. I'm Tanubi. And we're your president and vice president for SALSA. And so our goal is to foster a sense of community and diversity within law school, as well as showcasing our South Asian culture. Yeah, so we've got a number of pretty cool events coming up. Um, we've got Holy Festival at law school, and we have the DLA Piper Networking Series. So if that sounds like a bit of you, then come sign up at our booth. And we have jalebi there as well, so mm-hmm. if anyone wants jalebi. Good Indian sweets. <laughs> so if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, g'day, I'm Josh. I make up one-fifth of the Auckland Law Review directors for this year. Um, if you don't know what Auckland Law Review is, it is a show that is put on in August every year. Three shows, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. If you have any kind of discernible talent or not, um, <laughs> feel free to come sign up. If you can sing, dance or act, that is preferable, but it is not a guarantee that you're going to get in. I can't do any of those. Um, if you do want to know more about it, the other uh, law review directors are Emily Lyons, Hugo wagner hilliel Fintan Walsh, and Olive Brown. Those names probably don't mean anything for you right now, but you'll see them around. Um, if you have any questions about law review, about what it might entail, how much of a commitment it is, or anything like that, feel free to come hit me up or any of those other people, and I'll see you guys around. Hey guys, I'll keep this very brief because I know you're all very hungry for the barbecue. Um, my name is Fionn Torpola and this is the EOSEFA and we are the co-presidents for PILSA for 2019. Um, so PILSA is the Pacific Island Law Students Association. Our main focus is to promote and facilitate uh, Pacifica growth and excellence and that's in all facets, so cultural, academic and of course social. Um, anyway, we have some amazing events coming up so I'll hand over to Dee and she'll do a quick uh, rundown for those. Cool, so a couple of the events that are coming up um, over the next few weeks. Next Tuesday we have our chapel, and so that's when we um, welcome our part two students into law school. Um, We bless the Pacific Island flags that um, we all come from. And then week three we have our Pilsa Social, so this will be held at the Birdcage on Friday the 22nd. Um, Also, just for our membership, uh, you don't necessarily need to be Pacific Islander, so we welcome all cultures. Um, so yeah, it's very family orientated, so if you need some friends, just come to Pulsa, we'll help you out. That's all. Thank also, you guys. Also, uh, buy tickets from me for the social as well. And I'm me. For that. And me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Hiya. It's said that every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the slowest gazelle or go hungry. 
Equally every morning a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or be eaten. I'm Nadia, I lead the Auckland Law School Running Club. We, <laughs> um, we lead casual runs around the city for law students. We cater for all fitness or unfitness levels. So if you're interested, look, out, look for our Facebook page and come say hi afterwards. I'm also here on behalf of Niles, who couldn't be here today. They are not your average law students. And not that there is an average law student, but they cater for students who don't come to law school from a slightly different life path. So maybe they've had other degrees, other careers, maybe they're raising families at the same time. It can seem like everyone is 19 and hitting up all the steins, but when you look around, there are actually more of you than you think. So if this is you, come speak to me down at law school after and I'll put you in touch with Tarika. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, so my name's Jane and this is Sophie and we're from the Equal Justice Project. Um, for the people who don't know, the Equal Justice Project is a pro bono charity which is based at the law school. We use law students to help grow things like uh, social equality and inclusivity within our wider community. Um, and we have four teams. Um, so we've got four teams like Jane said and those are Access, Community, Communications and Pro Bono. Um, and Honestly, one of the cool things about our charity is that you will be exposed to legal experience and other forms of experience before you actually head out and try and get a clerkship or whatever. So um, a little bit about what Access does is they go into schools and promote um, yeah, social justice issues to our high school students or in other education centres. Um, community, um, if that's something that you're interested in, they um, will pop you in a community law centre so that um, you'll get in contact with um, lawyers and you'll be working with them and triaging all the cases that they work with, which is a really, really cool experience. Yeah, and communications, if you're really interested in writing, they write articles and parliamentary submissions on uh, topics which relate to our values. And pro bono, which is a team that I started off in, uh, they do legal research for legal practitioners in our community who are working on pro bono projects. And like the work they've done is really amazing, like they've had work go to the UN and the Supreme Court. Um, so yeah, it's a really great experience. Yeah, so if you have any questions, um, we'll be holding an information session on Friday the 8th of March, so that's next Friday, um, at 1 to 2 p.m., and the location is to be determined. Um, and uh, applications are opening on Monday the 11th of March, so um, we do have limited places, so we do encourage that you um, think about which team you'd like to apply for. And if you have any questions about those teams, we'll be hanging around down at the barbecue, so come uh, give us a chat and we'll let you know. Yeah, and saying that like in the past we've had this kind of um, image that you have to be like the perfect A plus student to be involved. You really don't. We're looking for people who are like genuinely passionate about helping the community and really passionate about um, increasing these values. Like whether you want to be a corporate lawyer or you want to be like the next Helen Clark. Yeah. Like we want all types of law students yeah. and we want to bring this experience to as many people as possible. So yeah, come talk to us. We'll be down at the barbecue and I think you'll be out of here soon. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Mike from Veritas. Veritas is a Christian group for law students. We get together because like, if you're a Christian and you're a law student, we have a lot in common. We meet um, weekly in the law school and we have uh, stellar Bible studies. And I think law school is one of the best places to learn about the Bible and the Christian faith because we get quite good at deriving the meaning of a text and the light of its purpose. <laughs> Sound familiar? Uh, you don't have to be a Christian to come along because the opportunities to talk openly and honestly about matters of faith is something that's quite rare at law school and it's something really important to do. We also host bigger events. In the past, we've had talks from prominent lawyers and judges. Um, so if you're interested, you can like our Facebook page. We'll also have a stool, stool set up um, at the barbecue down in law school. All right, thanks, guys. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Charlie, and this is Pia. We're here to talk to you guys uh, about moosing. So we're on the Moosing Society Exec. I am a co-president for this year. 
Uh, alongside Rachel, who can't be here today. Uh, she's preparing for an international moot, so she's quite busy. And then Piers, our engagement officer. So, mooting. Uh, some of you guys might have heard about it uh, in your first year. Um, basically, mooting is like mock court. So, there's only really one club at the law school where you can sharpen a suit and pretend to be a lawyer, and that's mooting. You're given a legal problem, um, you have to research it and develop arguments and then present in front of a judge. So obviously it's good from a just straight up law point of view. It really helps with your study, thinking on your feet. Um, it's also very good for the CV. Law firms like to see that you've actually taken the initiative to moot. Uh, and often you'll be judged by either practicing lawyers or older students. So it's a really good way to get contacts and talk to them after the competition and get their view on things. Uh, so like Charlie said, you know, you get to come up and pretend to be high respecter for a couple hours. Um, but we do have different kinds of competitions because we are trying to get as many of you guys involved as possible. So if you're not interested in joining a competition where you can win money at the end, um, we do have ones where you can just show up on the night, meet some new people, uh, practice your speaking skills, practice your thinking on your feet. Um, in a totally non-competitive environment, so we are trying to cater to that whole range. Um, and we'll hopefully see you guys there because we do also feed you when you come to our competitions. Free food is always good. <laughs> so in a moment, you'll head down to the law school um, and all the clubs will be doing sign-ups. When you sign up for AULSS, at that moment, they'll also ask, do you want to join the Moosing Society? So you say yes. What that will do is it will put you on our emailing list. So we'll mail out um, updates the next time we have a competition. Uh, also, we've made an Instagram. Um, so for everyone who has Instagram, um, please like us or whatever you do on Instagram. I, I don't have it myself. Uh, but thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you down there. All right, that's it. Um, head over to law school. We've got a barbecue coming up. Thank you very much for coming. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you on a few minutes. Thank you.